This ain't a song for the broken hearted No silent prayer for the faith party We might gonna be just a face in the crowd You're gonna hear my voice when I shout it out loud It's my life And it's now or never I ain't gonna live forever I just want to live While I'm alive It's my life Tack till tusen tack till dig Oda Dahl för en flott sång. Och hjärtlig välkommen alla till konferensen här idag. Statsminister, ordförre, ambassadörer, vänner av statskraft och alla som är här, hjärtlig välkommen. Som det är så de flesta där där det kom in hit så att teman som vi ska diskutera här idag de engagerar och det finns många olika syn på det vi i Statskraft driver med. Och jag syns det är viktigt att alla stämmene blir hört. Och så de kritiska stämmene så genom samtal och dialog så utvecklar vi oss och blir bättre, vi får bättre lösningar. Vi har alltså med den filosofin i bond så har vi inviterat representanterna från Latinamerikagruppen i Norge och Natur och ungdom här upp på scenen idag. Tema för årets statskraftkonferens det är kraft och handlekraft. Och det är för vi tränger bägge delar utan handlekraft i energifrågor så får vi inte nok kraft och utan kraft så får vi inte handlekraft verken i klima- eller industripolitiken. Och där som vi ska nå målen i 2030, 35 och 2040 så må vi handla nå. Under förre statskraftkonferensen för ett år sedan då hade Rysslands brutala angreppskrig på Ukraina allerede pågått i flera månader. Mange liv var allerede den gangen gått tapt, og millioner av mennesker var på flukt i Europa. Og krigen utløste den største energikrisen i Europa siden andre verdenskrig. Den spredte stark uro over energipriser og forsyningssikkerhet, og satt samholdet i Europa på prøve. Men det europeiske fellesskapet viste sig å være sterkt, handlekraftig och samlet. Europa bestod pröven. Men det var inte utan en kostnad. Och i Norge så kände 
vi alle på effekten av høye strømpriser. Det har vært store diskusjoner om kraftsystemet. Og ett år senere nå, så ser vi at strømprisene har vært krevende for, for mange. Selv om støtteordningene har dempet belastningen for husholdningene. Industrien her i Norge har vært delvis beskyttet gjennom langsiktige kontrakter, men mindre bedrifter har ikke hatt det. Og i Statskraft så jobber vi nå med å utvikle tilpassede kontrakter for næringslivet og tilby den type kontrakter til alle bedrifter som ønsker det allerede i dag. Vi ser også at kraftsystemet vårt det har vist seg å være robust og levert hele tiden. Problemet har vært eh, kraftprisene, men vi har aldri hatt en dårlig forsyningssikkerhet. Prisen, eh, altså energiprisen, har vært enda høyere i Europa. Eh, og Europa har håndtert krisen på imponerende vis. Og det skyldes jo et godt politisk samarbeid som inkluderer at man har greid å få tilgang på flytende naturgass, LNG, i store mengder til Europa for å erstatte russisk gass. Norge har økt sin produksjon også så langt det har vært mulig. Det har vært omfattende energisparing, både god energisparing som vi har alle tjent med, men også kutt av forbruk i europeisk industri som har smertet. Og ikke minst... Hele Europa har nå satset kraftfullt på eh, å bygge fornybar energi i enda økende tempo, enda større tempo enn det var tidligere. Og krisen er ikke over. Det kommer en ny vinter igjen eh, eh, om et halvt år, og det kan eh, fortsatt bli sårbart hele energisystemet for forstyrrelser i gassprisen, i gassforsyningen, men totalt sett så ser hele energibildet bedre ut, vesentlig bedre, enn det gjorde for et år siden. Klimakrisen, den er her. Der er FNs klimapanel helt tydelige. Og også selve naturen har sitt eget klimapanel. Og det er like tydelig. Naturen forsvinner i en hastighet som er enestående i menneskehetens historie. Og tapet av biomangfold, det akselererer. Og her kreves det også handling. Kampen mot klimaendringer, den er etter hvert velkjent. Men kampen for natur vil også bli viktig fremover. Og i kraftbransjen så må vi sørge for at vi bygger ut med så små naturingrep som mulig, og vi må også se på hvordan vi kan tilbakeføre områder til natur og gi naturen mer plass når vi bygger ut prosjekter. Vi er en av mange brukere av naturen, og fornybar energi er også en av naturens beste hjelpere, rett og slett fordi at det er med på å bevare klimaet i verden. Og fremover så trenger da både Norge, Europa og verden mer fornybar kraft. Statkraft, vi bidrar til dette. Vi er nå utviklet oss til å bli en av de store utviklerne av fornybar energi i verden. Frem mot 2030 så skal vi bygge ut cirka like mye ny kraftproduksjon som det Statkraft består av i dag. Og for oss som allerede er Europas største produsent av fornybar energi så er det en stor ambisjon. I Norge så skal vi gjennomføre fem store vannkraftoppgraderinger. Vi er aktive innen vindkraft på land, og vi ønsker også å satse på havvind her i Norge. Og energiomstillingen den blir ikke bare enkel å få til. Det er viktig at vi kommer videre, at vi går fra ord til handling, fra ambisjoner til mer konkrete løsninger. Hvordan sikrer vi samarbeid med industri, og sørge for lokal verdiskapning. Hvordan vi kan ha en rask nok utvikling, og samtidig gode nok løsninger for alle som berøres. Og hvordan kan vi samarbeide med Europa for å dempe kostnadene ved hele omstillingen, fra et dominerende fossilt til et dominerende fornybart energisystem. 
Det er det jeg håper denne konferansen i dag skal bidra til. En samtale om realitetene som kan bidra til å gjennomføre ambisjonene. Takk for at alle dere som kommer her vil bruke ettermiddagen sammen med oss i Statkraft. Og da er det en stor glede for meg å ønske vår statsminister Jonas Gahr Støre velkommen. Tusen takk, Kristian. Kjære alle sammen, god morgen. Det var en tid hvor jeg syntes det var veldig flott å leve i et land hvor vi hadde både Statoil og Statkraft. Og det var ikke fordi at det var spesielt viktig med en annen stat, men det signaliserte jo fellesskapets satsing på naturressurser. Og jeg er blant dem som nå lever godt med ordet Equinor. Jeg har stått på for dette viktige selskapet ute i et turbulent år, men jeg synes det er veldig flott at vi fortsatt har Statkraft. Og jeg har lyst på å si til alle de 5300 ansatte i 21 land at vi er stolte av den jobben dere gjør. Og jeg synes det er flott å være statsminister og reise rundt og nå bli møtt med at Statskraft er Europas fremste fornybar selskap. Og ikke bare da i volym og det dere kan vise til, men også i kompetanse. Svært, svært viktig. Takk for innledningen, Kristian. Og jeg skal gå rett på sak i de 12 minuttene jeg har utenfor. Det er ikke mulig å overvurdere utfordringen som er i Europa i dag med fullskala krig. Alvoret i det. Vi sier at vi nå lever med inflasjon for første gang på en generasjon, men vi har altså en åpen, drepende, ødeleggende krig på første gang på flere generasjoner. Og den følger ikke et skript. Derfor er det stor uforutsigbarhet som følger med det. Og det ligger bak som en veldig viktig ramme rundt alle de andre utfordringene vi nå skal håndtere, at vi har dette pågående på vårt kontinent. Vi går nå mot NATO-toppmøte i juli. Vi har akkurat hatt møte på Stortinget i formiddag, hvor et samlet storting, jeg tror vi er de eneste i Europa som har det slik, står bak Nansen-programmet, vår femårig hjelp til Ukraina. Det er et område hvor også kompetansen til statskraft kommer til å bli trengt, fordi Russland bomber systematisk og ødelegger kraftinfrastruktur. Og på et eller annet tidspunkt så blir jo det den store oppgaven at det landet igjen kan få kraft, ikke så avhengig av kjernekraften som de er. Så her ligger det en stor utfordring for oss. Så er det riktig i ettertid å si at Europa besto en viktig prøve da denne krisen ble rammet. Og en stor andel energi, russisk gass, gikk ut av miksen, og det skulle fylles med noe nytt. Det var et dramatisk år. Og samtalene med mine kolleger i Europa gjennom det året har gjort inntrykk på meg, og jeg er glad for at Norge var med og bidro til at man har kommet gjennom dette på en god måte inntil videre. For det er riktig som også Kristian sier, det kommer nye vintere, det skal fylles nye lagre, det skal skapes ny forutsigbarhet. Og russisk gass ut, samtidig som kjernekraft var på vei ned og ikke nok fornybar var på vei opp, det var en stor utfordring, men nå skjer det en massiv satsing på å få det fornybare opp, og det er veldig bra. De to store utfordringene vi møter politisk fremover som samfunn er energiomstillingen og demografiomstillingen. Og jeg tror Statskraft kommer til å stå midt i begge to. Hvordan rekrutterer vi unge mennesker til å ta de utdanningene som gjør at vi fortsatt er ledende på energi? Og hvordan klarer vi energiomstillingen som jo er eksepsjonell energi? betydningsfull i historisk sammenheng. Når sivilisasjoner bytter energiformer, så bytter makt, så flytter makt, så flyttes veldig mye. Og vi kommer til å stå sentralt i dette. Nå skal ikke jeg dra hele listen, men vårt utgangspunkt er jo godt. Med bedrifter, med eksport, med investeringer og med de mulighetene Norge har. Og det er også sterkt å følge kolleger i andre land hvilke utfordringer denne energikrisen faktisk har gitt dem med enormt høye priser, med høy statsgjeld og med store uløste spørsmål også på industrifeltet. Så vi har et godt utgangspunkt for å delta i dette. Vi må alltid sammenligne med andre når vi gjør en vurdering av vårt eget utgangspunkt. Så det er altså muligheter vi nå står overfor som vi må ta del i. Jeg har sagt på konferanser som dette før, vi lever ikke i oljealderen i Norge, vi lever i energialderen. Og det betyr at den lange historien må med når vi ser perspektivene fra vannkraften. Så alle årene som gikk til oljen kom, 
Vi hadde ikke oljekompetanse, men vi hadde kraftkompetanse og forvaltningskompetanse. Vi fikk oljen, vi fikk gassen, og nå er vi altså på vei inn i det fornybare for alvor i Norge. Og vi må se på det som en stor mulighet for oss. Kombinasjonen av teknologi, kompetent arbeidskraft, utdanning, det vi har av eksportledende industri, det vi har av dyktige selskaper. Det er en styrke i den omstillingen vi skal inn i. Vi har faktisk muligheten til å lede an i det som blir et nytt kapittel i energifortellingen om Norge. Tre store utfordringer, og jeg er enig med Kristian i at det handler kraft. Det handler om, men handlekraft, gode venner, er ikke en enaktørs oppgave. Jeg tror handlekraften kommer til å bli bestemt ut fra hva vi klarer sammen. For det vil regjeringer av ulik formasjon merke, at dette er ikke en en regjerings stortingsflertallsvedtakssak. Hele samfunnet må være med på å lykkes på det vi nå skal gjennom. Tre utfordringer. Vi må snakke om kraftutbygging. Alle steder jeg reiser i Norge og får spørsmål om utfordring, så er egentlig svaret gitt. Mer kraft, mer nett, mer enøk. Og det som Energikommisjonen sa, det var et ganske drøyt ordtak. Det er ikke akkurat det du lærer barna dine. Mer av alt raskere. Men det er jo en måte å beskrive det på. Det var for omtrent slik jeg oppfatter også at Forsvarskommisjonen og Totalforsvarskommisjonen og NSM, alle som har noe å melde i dag, sier mer av alt raskere. Det er i seg selv en demokratisk spennende oppgave. Men det er altså en utfordring for oss å finne ut hva, hvor og hvordan vi gjør dette. Og jeg vil si i min første sak her at vi skal få til mer kraftutbygging, utfordrer nettopp det. Vi skal og må løse denne fosensaken. Den er vi egentlig sammen om, statkraft og vi, og regndrifta og industriaktørene. Og den illustrerer jo utfordringen vi har med unike vindkraftressurser, men samtidig så har vi beite og urfolk og forpliktelser. Der ligger kraftutbygging. Utfordring i et nøtteskall. Ingen enkelt aktør kommer til å klare dette alene. Vi er nødt til å få det til sammen. Vi skal realisere kraftutbygging i et land som har unike vindkraftressurser på land. Og vind på land er åpenbart den lavest hengende frukten vi kan ta tak i. Men det å få til kombinasjonen mellom kommunen, aktørene og befolkningen i en tid hvor mye av stemningen har vendt, krever at vi trekker lærdommer av hvordan den første vindkraftfasen var. Og det er klart når du reiser rundt i et lokalsamfunn som sa vi ja, vi sa ja til en type vindmøller. Men på den samme konsesjonen så står det nå dobbelt så store som det vi så. Og hvor blir det av de lokale ringvirkningene og alle de spørsmålene som følger av industri og økonomisk utvikling? Det må vi lære av. Men jeg mener at forholdene ligger til rette for at vi kan klare det. Vi skal gjøre dette i samarbeidet med kommune, med industri og med de store mulighetene som er fra lengst i nord. Sigurd hos deg oppe i Lebesby, til lenger sør, så har Norge forutsetningene til dette på land. Punkt to. Vi må snakke om havet, og vi må derfor også snakke om kostnader. Vi har unike havvindmuligheter. Her kommer jo Norge etter resten av Europa. Fordi vi har holdt på med olje og gass, så har de jo, når vi flyr inn til Europa, det ser vi, har de bygget havvindmøller i mange, mange år. Nå kommer vi etter, og det er nødvendig. Dere kjenner ambisjonen. Det er at vi skal kunne bygge like mye kraft fra havvinden frem mot 2040, som omtrent den vi har fra vannkrafta i dag. Det er heller ingen enkel sak, når nesten alle i vår del av Europa vil det samme samtidig. Så blir det utfordringer på kostnader, på behovet for å skalere opp, og på behovet for å utvikle og innovere på teknologi. Jeg er fast bestemt på at det skal vi klare. Det å sette dette på pause nå vil være historisk feil. For da blir vi hengende etter det som kan bli en unik mulighet. Og det er den flytende havvinden i fremtiden som er muligheten. Det er den minst modende, men det er der vi er kommet lengst. Vi kommer ikke til å konkurrere med den bunnfaste havvinden som tysker og nederlender og belger og andre har utviklet. Men på den flytende havvinden så kan vi det. Og det er det som i stor grad kommer til å bli det verden vil etterspørre. Men da er det altså en stor oppgave at kostnadene er sånn som de er, og det kommer ikke til å være en rett fremvei dette. Når vi skal lykkes i denne energiomstillingen, så tror jeg vi politikere og dere i næringslivet må også erkjenne at vi kommer til å møte ganske brå svinger på den veien. Noe kommer til å stoppe opp, noe kommer til å bli utsatt, noe kommer til å akselerere, og det er bra. Så skal vi diskutere alle oppgavene som tiden er for kort til å gå inn i, hvordan vi laver lagringsløsninger for energi, den fornybare, hvordan vi får den fornybare energien som er uregulerbar til å fungere med den regulerbare vannkraften. 
Men igen så mener jeg vi har forvaltnings- og reguleringskompetens i Norge som er unik, og det skal vi altså klare. Det kommer nå et nett rundt Nordsjøen. Et Nordsjønett, hvor vi kanskje litt ned i bakken kommer til å få en situation med ganske god tilgang på kraft. Men den skal organiseres og fordeles og samarbeides om, og min ambition er at norsk leverandørindustri skal være i fremste rekke. Alt fra verftene våre til den digitale delen av dette, som jo er svært, svært viktig. For det tredje, vi må snakke om klima. Vi skal nå våre klimamål. Det er en stor og krevende oppgave, og den er knyttet til kraft. For skal vi nå disse målene, så må vi altså ha tilgang til den kraften som skaper økonomisk aktivitet, og den må ikke belaste klima. Og derfor så kommer vi til å få en diskussion fremover som blir mer skarp i forhold til hva prioriterer vi av bruk av kraft. Det kommer ikke til å være sånn at en vær som rekker hånda i været får en kontakt og en kontakt å sette den inn i og si at det er fritt fram. Jeg tror det kommer til å melde seg en mer avansert diskussion om hva kan vi prioritere i hvilken sammenheng. Industrien vår er en del av kvotesystemet i Europa. Det er et effektivt system. Det skjerpes. Nå kommer nye sektorer som skipsfart og luftfart får fullt inn i kvotesystemet, men det er den ikke-kvotepliktige sektoren, transport, avfall, landbruk, som er vår store oppgave og utfordring. Og vi må sørge for at det er kraft nok for den. Så det vi har av overskudd må vi virkelig prioritere for å gå den veien. Vi har mulighet innenfor CO2-håndtering. Krigen i Ukraina har jo på en paradoxal måte forskjøvet på i skiftet. Og det er sterkt å oppleve i samtaler med tyske kolleger som inntil for et par år siden kjempet mot CCS. Den tyske næringsministeren, den lederen for de grønne i Tyskland, han sa til mig: en del av min politiske identitet var å være mot CCS. Nå er han for. Og ikke bare litt, men veldig. Fordi CCS også er veien til hydrogen. Norge har en stor mulighet her. Vi må være i føresettet. 15. maj blev den første kommersielle avtalen for permanent lagring av CO2 i Norge inngått mellom Øst Ørsted og Northern Light. Og det er jo spennende da, og ikke science fiction, og jeg skal ikke trekke konklusjonen. Men nå diskuterer jo Equinor med sine partnere mulighetene for at man kan få hydrogen i rør fra Norge til Europa, og muligheten for at vi kan få CO2 i rør fra Europa opp til kysten og til lagring i Nordsjøen. Så, gode venner, dette er mitt siste punkt. Vi kommer ikke til å lykkes med dette om ikke vi opprettholder en langsiktig linje i åpenhet med verden rundt oss. Samarbeid med kapitalen, teknologien, politikken som skjer, og der er Europa det handler om. Vi har nå inngått en grønn allianse med EU. Det er første avtale EU inngår av det formatet etter at de inngikk en med Japan. Og det er en omfattende avtale som legger grundlage for samarbeid på disse områder. Disse områdene det er i store muligheter for oss. Vi bygger opp industrisamarbeid med store enkeltland. Tyskland er i fremste rekke. Men mitt siste poeng her er tilbake igjen til det vi må få til sammen i Norge. Og jeg mener at vårt arbeid med helhetlige forvaltningsplaner, tradisjonen med å se næringer i sammenheng med hverandre, og nå også å ta inn over oss ansvaret vi har og respekten vi skal ha for vårt urfolk, samiske rettigheter, for regndriften, som eksempel på de avveiningene vi må gjøre. Og da går denne forpliktelsen til dialog begge veier. Den går i retning av å si at Norge bør ha land nok og ressurser nok til å få dette til å balansere, at vi får mer kraft, men at vi bygger og utvikler den på en måte i sameksistens med de viktige hensynene som er der ute. Og hvis det er noe land som kan klare det i lys av energihistorien, som ikke er en oljealder, men en energialder, så er det Norge. Derfor så går vi in i den mest spennende tiden, tror jeg, noen gang i den historien. Og vi kan komme ut til å være på vinnersiden av den om vi gjør det sammen. Takk for oppmerksomheten. Tusen takk, statsminister. Og la meg også få introdusere Maruk Ali, som er journalist og programleder, og som skal lede oss gjennom program i dag, sammen med Klaus Sonberg, som er kommunikasjonsdirektør i Statkraft, og som vil komme opp etterpå. Tusen hjertelig takk til, til dere for det. Og vi starter med å 
spørre dere om dere beskriver et tempo som vi må få til. Om fem år så er Europa ser helt annerledes ut når det kommer til fornybar energi. Hvordan vil, og om ti år så er de endringene enda større, hvordan vil dette påvirke Norge? Starter med deg, Støre. Ja, for, for det første skal vi komme igjennom de fem årene med å ta kloke beslutninger, hvor det man finner ut er et møte med de tre tene. Ting tar tid. Hmm. Og i en tid hvor vi også er utålmodige. Vi har jo kortet ned på tiden for å gjøre det raskere. Men jeg tror vi kommer til å se en forhåpentligvis god overgang mellom tyngdepunktet fra de fossile energidelene til de fornybare. At det kan skje i leverandørindustrien, at det kan skje ved verftene våre og i, i kompetansemiljøene våre. På slutten av det ti året vil vi få norske vindmøller opp på, på vår sokkel. Vi må legge grunnlaget for det, og vi må utvikle mer fornybar kraft på land. Og da er det jo å komme i gang med på en måte som lokalsamfunn kan være med på. Mer vind på land som harmonerer med de behovene folk har, som jeg nevnte nå i sted. At vi stifter bekjennskap med å lykkes med sol, som kan bli en nesten vel så viktig kilde som Vind. Og det spennende er jo at de nye generasjonene som nå kommer ut fra utdanning og skal gå løs på dette, dette er jo hverdagen deres. Men for oss, Kristian, så er det jo litt sånn at det er en omstilling fra å ha vært vant til en annen energimiks. Men det er jo denne nye energimiksen blir jo deres utgangspunkt. Så hvordan vi Norge ser ut? Jeg håper det er et land som da er i front på denne fornyelsen, og at vi kan være inspirert og stolt av det. Eh, I dag bare, bare er vi... Jeg legge til at i Europa, så bygge, ble, i fjor, 22, så ble det bygd 50 gigawatt med fornybar energi. Det er to og et halvt startkraft, eh, og den takten er økende. Så nå så er fornybar industrien globalt mye større enn olje- og gassindustrien. Det, bare for noen få år siden før covid så var det cirka like stort. Nå så investeres 1,7 ganger mer i fornybar i verden enn, enn, i, enn i olje og gass. Og den utviklingen vil bare akselerere, så at Norge skal i, i Europa, som også har samme utviklingen, vi kommer til å være en, en stor nasjon i eh, fornybar, mye vindkraft, som statsministeren sier, backet opp av vannkraften vår, og den er det bare Norge som har i den skala eh, eh, som vi faktisk har. Og hva skal til for å være konkurranse? Dyktig. Vi er energiledende i dag, men for å være det i fremtiden, hva vil være vårt fortrinn i tillegg til vann som du nevner? Altså, vi, vi har blant de beste vindressursene i hele Europa, men, så, så det må utnyttes. Vi må greie å få det samspillet på land, eh, som vi begge nettopp har snakket litt om, eh, og få natur og eh, lokal befolkning, inkludert eh, samisk befolkning, til å leve i et samspill her, sånn at det går an å ha både energi og andre næringer i, i Norge, og spesielt i nordlige delen. Det, det, det må vi få til. Og så har vi da den vannkraften som vi i Statkraft, og, og også andre kraftprodusenter i Norge skal oppruste, sånn at vi får et enda mer kraftfullt system som backer opp når vindkraften ikke er der. Så vi kommer til å ha Europas kraftigste vannkraftmotor. Vi har det allerede i dag, og den blir sterkere. Samtidig vil vi henge sammen med et Europa i kabler og med vindkraft. Og så må vi designe hele det systemet der, sånn at vi har nok kraft og netto kraft i Norge, slik at vi greier å holde kraftprisene moderat lave her. Så vi jeg spørre, statsminister, du nevnte innledningsvis at vi skal gjøre lite av alt, og i et raskt tempo. Ikke lite av alt, mer av alt. Mer av alt, mer av alt. Samtidig. Samtidig. Og så er det slik at vi har noen forpliktende klimamål for 2030. Hva vil du si til de forskerne som mener det er helt umulig at vi klarer å, å nå de med dagens tempo? Nei, men dagens tempo er ikke nok. Spørsmålet er om dagens beslutninger gjør det nok. Til, å, til at vi kan nå, nå dem. Og jeg, jeg er trygg på at vi kan nå dem, men det kommer til å kreve veldig mye av de beslutningene, og at de blir gjennomført, og at vi klarer å bære dem fram. Og, og det som er, det Rynning Tønnesen nevner av det vi har, er jo et utgangspunkt at vi har de kraftressursene, at vi har den industrien som et utgangspunkt. Vi begynner ikke på bar bakke. Men det, noe av det viktige jeg vil legge til er kompetansen, og at det fortsatt kommer unge mennesker som velger disse utdanningene for, for å komme dit. Og da tror jeg vi må kunne vise dem. Vi har jo nå jobbet veldig med å eh, 
få frem en grön bok som ska telle utslipp som vi teller pengar för att visa att vi kan gå den vägen vi ligger på efterskudd men det är er inne räckvidd att vi kan klara det om vi klarer att hålla det tempo uppe men det er på ingen måte enkelt och det är er många klassiska målkonflikter som är er där så den handkraften som igen blir vist inledningsvis den blir helt nödvändig men det som gör den både spännande och komplicerat er att det är er ikke en enkelt aktör som jag sa handkraft det är er nog vi har, faktisk være med och eie och göra sammen. Så din besked er att vi kommer till att klara det. Vi ska klara det det må vara det klara målet och hvis vi klarer det det är er jo det jeg vil lägga till då. Det er att om Norge når sine mål så har vi uppfyllt förpliktelser i världens målestock så måner det väldigt lite men måten vi når målet på kan det få enorm betydning i världen. Hvis vi klarer att kommersialisera och lyckas med fångst och lagring av CO2 så har jo vi en teknologi som kommer att bli efterspurt. Hvis vi lyckas med flytande havvind och klarer att göra det tillgängligt och användbart för industri på land så har vi ett verdensprodukt för det världens befolkning bor nära kusten hvor detta ska utvecklas och så vidare. Det vi har i kombination vattenkraft förnybar kraft är er också en unik kompetens som världen efterspörer. Så när vi våra mål kommer liksom innanför räckvidd av det så har vi samtidigt bekräftat att det ligger en jättemöjlighet internationellt för oss. Och upp i allt detta så så tränger man att ha med sig folk og vi har sett att klimadebatten väcker starka følelser. Eh, vad tror du är er grunden till att den blir uppfattas så polariserande? Jag tror att detta grundläggande att den omställningen må ha en sån grundpremiss av rättfärdighet att hvis folk upplever att någon enkelgrupper eller någon sociala eh, delar av arbetsmarknaden vårt blir rammet och blir slått ut så får vi starka motkrafter. Och därför så må det och upprätthålla en arbetslivsmodell som stöttar folk i att få kompetens, att vi fortsätter att ha små skillnader och stor tillit till samhället vårt, det är er viktigt. De samhällen som får stor streck i laget kommer att ha väldigt stora problem att genomföra den omställningen. Det ser vi på ett exempel som Frankrike, ett land som, som har stått i, I detta att andra motsättningar som inte kommer fra energi, de slår igenom. De gula västarna är er ofta blivit kallt som dråpen som fick begret att flyta över. Så det intressanta är er egentligen dråpen men det är er begre. Vad vad blev fyllt upp i det begre som gjorde att liksom det gick i lås. Och där er dit vi inte må komma och därför så står jag här som statsminister är er inte lika populärt på standard med att se si att små skillnader och god omfördelning det är er klok politik också för värdeskapning och näringsliv. Och så må jo vi som bygger ut kraft evne och ha lytte och ha dialog med de som faktiskt bor där hvor vi håller på. Uh, og vi mener jo at vi har gode systemer for det, men det, blir jo, det kan jo alltid gjøres bedre. Og, og det gäller enten, enten det er i Sør-Amerika eller i Norge, uh, at vi faktiskt har hensyn. Og det samme gäller naturen, som ikke kan snakke selv, men som vi kan observera alle, at den må vi også ta vare på, som jeg var lite inne på i mitt inlägg. Så uh, vi, Norge har jo varit gjennom en omstilling før, eller en gigantisk... Vi hade Vi hade inte mycket vattenkraftskompetens i Norge för vi började bygga vattenkraft och vi har blivit en av världens ledande nationer på det. Vi hade inte nog olje- och gaskompetens i 1969 då man fant det första oljefältet och vi var ledande i världen 15 år efter på. Nu så kommer havvind, nu så kommer det mer vind på land och allt styrningssystem som ska till för att samspela med vattenkraften. Det kan vi också bli ledande på. Det, det, det detta är er ju bara detta är er ju fullt möjligt. Uh, og, uh, og så skal vi sørge for at vi får en leverandørindustri som vi skal være med og leve av siden. Det kommer jo da til å bli den største energisektoren, det er det allerede i verden, nemlig fornybar energi, og da må jo vi backe det med våra leverandørbedrifter også. Tusen hjertelig takk, statsminister Jonas Gahr Støre og Kristian Rynning Tønnesen. Well, couldn't have asked for a better starting off conversation for the slides that I'm about to show you today. I'm going to, I lead our clean power practice at Bloomberg NEF. We're a market research provider. Um, and I'm going to take you through our, our outlook for clean energy, starting with a look backward. So this is a report that we put out every year. It's our Energy Transition Investment Trends Report. 
And it's our first take in January of what we think happened over the past year around the energy transition, not just clean power. There's a couple of really noteworthy findings from this particular study. Uh, one is that we tracked $1.1 trillion of investment in the energy transition over 2022, the first year that we exceeded a trillion dollars in our analysis, and a 31% year-on-year increase relative to 2021, so a huge, huge year for the energy transition. It was also the first year that we estimate that energy transition investment matched investment in fossil fuels. And that's really impressive because investments in fossil fuels also rose in 2022, driven by an increased focus on energy security. And particularly exciting for the people in the room today, clean power remains the largest source of investment in the energy transition. Now, that's true at a global level, but when we start to dig into this at a regional level, you can start to see some of the complexities of that statement and some of the reasons why we view 2022 as the end of an era in the energy transition. So this is the exact same data that I just showed you, but now broken down for three key markets. So here we're looking at the EU27, US, and Asia Pacific. And if we just look at the trend for clean power, Asia Pacific is still rising. It's actually the bulk of the growth that we're seeing in the market. A lot of that is China, but it's other key markets as well, like Australia, India, and so forth that are rising. But if you start to look at the US and Europe, clean energy investment's actually been declining over the last few years. Now, broken down by technology, it's a bit more complex. Solar is largely rising, not in every market, but in most markets. It's really wind that's either stagnated or declined in most of these two regions. And all of that's happening at a time when investments in electric vehicles are skyrocketing. And because of that, we think that 2022 is the last year that clean power is going to dominate our scores. We think when we do this analysis again this year and we publish our new numbers next January, 2023 is going to be the year that electric vehicles overtake clean power. Now, part of what's going on here is that we're having some of the bite of the challenges of the energy transition hitting us. You can see increased geopolitical tensions around who's going to own the transition, who's going to own the manufacturing and the industry. And you can also see challenges around developing renewable energy itself. So one of those challenges is grid interconnections. This is a chart that's showing you the cues for new grid connections for wind and solar in key markets in the US and Europe. And these cues are growing. It means that these connect, cannot connect until they get approval, right? So this is all projects waiting to be developed. In UK, Spain, Italy, France, and Germany, so five European markets, we think that the grid queue is equivalent to 85% of Europe's total 2030 target for clean power just stuck waiting in queues to interconnect. It can take five to eight years now to get environmental permits and interconnection on average in Europe. There's some markets that are longer. And all of this means that those 2030 targets are getting harder to hit. At the same time, we're seeing the levelized cost of electricity rising across the world. Now, when we put out that analysis last year, it was the first time in the history of Bloomberg NEF that we attract increases in the levelized cost of electricity. It's driven by a number of factors, inflation, uh, interest rate rises, rising cost of capital as a result of that, higher equipment costs, uh, higher labor costs, uh, supply chain constraints, all of these are factoring in. And while the levelized cost of electricity has come down in our most recent analysis that came out last week, so over the course of this year, it's still higher than the numbers that we were seeing in 2020. So we're still in an elevated cost environment. Now, the eagle-eyed of you are looking at this chart and noticing that wind looks like the exception to my rule. It's not. Uh, what's happening in wind is a bifurcation. So in China, feed-in premiums for uh, wind were removed in 2020. As a result, we've been seeing the levelized cost of electricity coming down, driven by lower equipment costs. But in the rest of the world, prices are going up. This is for offshore wind, which is a bit more up and down. Onshore wind, it's a straighter story. And we're not through these equipment cost rises. So here you can see equipment costs for solar, wind, and energy storage. Solar is the good news story here. Uh, we've been saying that prices for polysilicon were going to come down for a while now. That actually finally happened over the last six months. 
Uh, but for wind and for storage, we think that the higher system costs, the higher equipment costs, and the higher levelized cost of electricity as a result are here to stay for the next few years. That's for a few reasons. One is because the contracts that are signed today won't be deployed into a project until towards the end of the decade. And it's also because, especially in wind, you're seeing manufacturers keeping prices high to win back some of their declining margins in recent years. Now, despite all of these challenges, renewables are still the cheapest source of power in countries worth 82% of global electricity generation. So that is the good news. And that's because even though the costs for wind and solar and storage have been going up, they've also been going up for gas and coal. And that's really important because we're going to need a lot more of it if we're going to hit net zero emissions by 2050. So this chart is from our new energy outlook. That is the analysis we do every year, which is our view of how the energy sector will evolve through 2050. Um, we do two scenarios in this work, the economic transition scenario or non, no transition scenario, just deploys least cost technologies without a carbon budget. And our net zero scenario does the same thing, but enforces a carbon budget that gets us to net zero in 2050 and keeps us aligned with the Paris Climate Accords. So at the top here, you can see the dotted line. That's the carbon emissions in our economic or no transition scenario. And the dashed lines are the emissions in our net zero scenario. The colors in between show you what's driving emissions reductions. And the big story here is that clean power is the vast majority of the source of emissions reductions between our no transition and net zero scenarios. Now, this does vary depending on where you are in the world. So here you can see some of our recent reports that have come out that break down that analysis by region or by country. Um, in China and Australia, where you still have grids that are highly driven by coal relative to other parts of the world, it is really clean power deployment that allows us to achieve net zero. But in Europe, where you've got a slightly more decarbonized grid already, uh, it's actually more about electrification. It's about sending investment towards new, electrifying new sectors like transport and industry, although clean power still plays a big role. So that's where we need to get to for net zero by 2050. And the question is, are we on track for that today? And if you just look at solar, we kind of are. So here on uh, my right, I guess your guys' left, you can see our view of how solar deployment will go through 2030 based off the current environment that we can see today. And then you have our net zero scenarios required build on the other side. Uh, and these are really similar to each other, we're about 90% of the way there, according to our solar team. But if you look at onshore wind, offshore wind, and batteries, it's a much less rosy picture. So those three sectors would need to see their forecasted, forecasted build in 2030 triple to be in line with net zero. So we're a long way away from being on a path for a net zero economy. Now, I don't want to leave you guys on a completely negative note because this stuff can still change. Um, I'm going to leave you with three signposts. Just in the interest of time, we only had 10 minutes. I'm only going to show you one of them in a slide form, but there are three. The first one is uh, declining costs. So despite the fact that we're still in a high cost environment, we do think ultimately costs will come down. We expect a 40 to 60% decline in the levelized cost of electricity for our key technologies by 2050. Uh, a lot of that's driven by um, increased scale technology improvements and in wind higher capacity factors. I think we'll probably hopefully talk more about that in the Q&A. Uh, another big one to look out for is new power purchase agreements. So that could come from the traditional corporate players or utilities that we're seeing today, but even more interesting to watch for the energy transition might be the new sectors, hydrogen and direct air capture, that could be coming online as well. Now, at the moment, direct air capture and hydrogen might be favoring 24-7 power solutions like nuclear, geothermal, potentially hydro here in Norway, a bit more than it'll favor wind and solar due to the way regulation's being set. But really watching that story play out is going to be important. And finally is reforms. So our previous uh, discussion, the Prime Minister was mentioning uh, the need for new permitting, more, more grids, everything like that. This is something we're watching very closely. We are seeing a number of European countries that are adjusting the conditions for environmental permits. 
Um, we're also seeing a lot more effort in how we can expand the grid more quickly. And I'll just finish off on one non-European example in Brazil, where we are seeing the first ever uh, tender for transmission lines in that country, which will be designed to bring power from the wind-heavy north to the south in Rio and Sao Paulo, where demand lies. Um, and with that, I think we are gonna invite my uh, two new friends up here to have a Q&A. <laughs> Thank you, Meredith. <laughs> One, wonderful to have such an expert uh, on stage, uh, and I would like to invite one more uh, fantastic expert, uh, my colleague, Mr. Turius uh, Bolkischer, uh, Head of Global Drivers in, in, in Statskraft. And uh, while you're on the way up, uh, Turius, i uh, just remind you, in this session you can ask uh, questions to Turius and Meredith using slido.com. Um, uh, hashtag uh, Stadtkraft or Emneknag Stadtkraft. And I get them up my uh, pad and I will try to uh, forward them to you. But, but Todius, um, looking at Meredith and Bloomberg NEF's uh, research, uh, how does that compare to uh, our own research in Stadtkraft? There are many similarities uh, and there are also some differences. So thank you for, for the very interesting presentation. Um, Starting with the similarities, we also see a, a deep energy transition coming towards 2050 based mainly on the continued large-scale uh, growth of renewable power replacing fossil. That, uh, that is, uh, the direction is clear, but the speed is, is still uncertain, I think. And also the electrification of transport uh, industries, as you mentioned, but also heating, I think, is also coming, and that's also uh, very clear in our uh, analysis. Um, we also share the view and we experience the view on, on the short-term uh, cost increases uh, in renewable power, but also the, the, we share uh, largely the visions for, for the um, developments in the long term towards still decreasing costs as there is still learning effects to, to utilize there. When it, when it comes to the differences, um, I think your uh, net zero scenario is kind of a what does it take scenario. So it, it means what does it take to reach net zero by 2050. Over low emission scenario in Statcraft is taking a slightly different approach. We, we ask what is an optimistic but yet realistic scenario if markets, policies, technologies mutually uh, work together to, uh, to enhance the opp opportunities uh, that are there. And what we see when we compare those scenarios is that we have a similar growth in wind and solar, but we are lagging behind in our scenario compared to yours on the hard to abate sectors. That is, how fast can we reduce emissions in long distance transportation and in some hard to abate emissions in industries. For example, we have, you or the BNF net zero is seven times as much uh, CCS by 2050 as we have in our low emission scenario. So that's a big, big difference. And that's a technology that still needs policy support, policy push to develop. And why, why are there differences here? Yeah, that's, uh, that's due to these uh, approaches. Uh, I, think, uh, I think Meredith is asking, what does it take? We are looking at what is possible if, uh, if markets, policies, technologies mutually uh, develop. So I think that's right. You know, we are setting a carbon budget. We are forcing the system to achieve net zero in 2050 in our net zero scenario. I'd still say that, you know, it's increasingly optimistic, but possible, mm. our scenario. It is. Um, we definitely need new policies on industry. We're starting to see some movement there. The hope is that by the end of this uh, year, we'll finally be where we thought we were going to be last year in terms of hydrogen development, um, which is key for industrial decarbonization here in Europe. Uh, we saw the first, uh, not just MOU, but actual offtake for green steel produced from hydrogen last week. So we're, we're getting closer, but that sort of stuff, CCS, hydrogen, direct air capture, it has to scale this decade. And if it doesn't scale this decade, then you're right, we're going to miss net zero targets for sure. Yeah, and I think that comparison is interesting because it, uh, it shows the main uncertainties in the long term. Uh, and I want to ask you about risks okay. and uncertainty because <laughs> Professor David Wichter is uh, in the next session. He's going to talk about risks and uncertainties. And I know to you that you, uh, you, you often think that we don't, as an industry, talk enough about this. Uh, uh, so to both of you, when you look at your research, what are the main sort of risks and, uh, and uncertainties? 
Should I start? Just start? Okay. Yeah. Yes, I think it's very important because uh, what we show is one scenario and, uh, and the outcome space is huge here. So, so understanding the risk and, and uncertainties is, is um, really the key, I would say. And, and in, in the energy transition, I think, I think there, are, there is at least two layers to that uncertainty. It's the uncertainty that we see in the energy sector itself. With, uh, and, uh, and there, in the, at least in the short and medium term, I think the question is how much renewables can we actually uh, deploy and build um, uh, within uh, the time frames we have for the climate targets to towards 2030. And here, we, we, as has been mentioned already, we experience major uh, bottlenecks in grid, in land availability, in permitting. And this, this illustrates the dilemmas we are also facing in, uh, in uh, developing a new energy system, requiring area, um, while at the same time um, we need to, to keep in mind that we have to choose solutions that are sustainable in all ways. So, uh, and uh, kind of keeping the speed while at the same time making those good solutions or taking those uh, good choices is, uh, is really the uncertainty within the energy sector. Then I also would like to mention before I leave the world for to you, Meredith, that we also have a, another layer which is related to the world outside the energy sector, like the geopolitical tension we are experiencing uh, at the moment, uh, social unrest, uh, and uh, also the global economic development, inflation, interest rate, and so forth, is also affecting uh, the speed of the energy transition. It's not going to change the direction, I think, but it, it, it may delay the, uh, some of these issues may delay the energy transition. Great. Uh, short, Meredith, because yeah, we're getting I mean, a lot of uh, questions on Slido Oh, fantastic. Well. <laughs> so I agree with everything that was just said here. I think the one other thing I'll throw in is that uh, yeah, I manage our wind solar grids practices as well as some analysts that are looking at other technologies, geothermal, nuclear. I used to work on heating and hydrogen, background in power and gas. The one that I'm kind of being kept awake about at night right now is that our onshore wind, the gap between what we think is needed for onshore wind versus what we think is achievable given current bottlenecks on that industry is increasingly widening. Um, so what comes in to fill that gap? Is it more wind? Are we going to be able to do that? Or is it about nuclear, geothermal? I mean, here in Norway, you're lucky to have hydro, but not every country has that. So what is the market opportunity for those other 24-7 power solutions? Okay. One question from Slido is, if 80% of the renewable energy projects in Europe is, are waiting for, in line to get on grid, uh, what's the solution? <laughs> Uh, there's a couple. I mean, the easy one is build more grid, but that's not as easy to do, of course, because you have to consider permitting. I think there are some quick wins that we can do. What we're finding is that markets that go for a ready-to-build rather than a first-come, first-serve permitting process tend to have a more efficient queue system. Uh, so that means that you need to come in with like kind of a realistic project, not a pie-in-the-sky project. Uh, that reduces the amount of time that you waste on infeasible projects. Uh, and another one is digitalization. So there's a lot that we can do, actually, through leveraging digitalization, demand-side flexibility, not just on the grid itself, but even uh, digitalization of the system that we use for permitting. Um, all of this can really help speed up the process. Torius, any comments on green constraints? No, I'd just like to add that, uh, you know, the driver is not only climate, it's also about energy security and affordable energy prices. So mm -hmm. there should be a strong push to... Uh, to keep that uh, queue lower than it is currently. Mm. So Meredith, on a different topic, inflation cost increases on everyone's lips. Yes. Uh, you show a projection of sort of 40 to 60 percent yeah. decrease in cost towards 2050. Yeah. So what are the key drivers behind that? So the key driver behind that is uh, equipment improvements across the board. So for solar, what you're talking about is thinner wafers, thinner cells, mm -hmm. uh, more efficient systems as well. We're moving uh, to new technologies for solar manufacturing now that are going to achieve that. Um, in wind, it's about moving to larger and larger per megawatt uh, turbines. That reduces the amount of cables that you need, the amount of foundation that you need, the O&M that you're going to have to spend, the installation time. And as you get longer blades, you also achieve higher capacity factors mm -hmm. in wind. Now, will it be a smooth path towards that? Absolutely not. We're seeing that today. 
but we do think that there's a fair amount of substitution that can be done on some of the higher cost metals commodities. And so that's going to be watching that transition over time, how smooth the path is towards that decline. Mm -hmm. A question building on that, uh, an aspect of cost. Is the cost increase more negative for renewables than for fossil? No, maybe this year it is, but last year it was definitely worse on fossil fuels than it was on renewables, which is why you still saw the economics favoring yeah. renewable build. Okay. First presentation I've seen in a conference like this where China is only a small part of a, a slide. You need to comment a bit <laughs> more on, on China. Oh. How is, is development in China going to affect uh, what we're talking about? I mean, that's the, the big question, isn't well, it? Oh, we have three months. <laughs> <laughs> we have a whole summit on this. Um, so China is the vast majority of the build that we're seeing right now in clean power. As I said, other parts of the world are declining in investment. China is still rising. Um, the question is how much does that benefit actually go to other parts of the world, right? Because right now in China, it is Chinese companies supplying Chinese companies for Chinese projects. Uh, and with the amount of protectionism happening now around manufacturing, you can look at IRA's manufacturing tax credits for solar. You can look at Europe's response to that, trying to relocalize manufacturing here. Uh, that's higher cost systems um, on the ground for those other markets. And so you could have a continued bifurcation in the market like the ones we're seeing on for wind. Wind, harder to transfer across oceans. Turbines are pretty large nowadays, uh, but solar and storage can still be sent around sea pretty easily. But uh, you could start to see those markets following what's happening in wind, if um, you know, depending on how policy pushes things. Okay. Torius, you mentioned geopolitics. Do you want to say anything more about China? I, I agree in your assessment. Uh, I think it's really uh, an important area to, to focus on, and we do it every day because it has uh, the, China has such a large share of the total uh, value chain within the renewables, mm -hmm. and we see the tendencies of diversification and uh, and also uh, protectionism. So, so this is really uh, important. Uh, again, I, I'm uh, I'm optimistic enough to say that it's not going to. Any further tension is not going to change the direction of the energy transition because the, the, the technologies are already so developed. But it, it may be a, one of the factors that may delay it more than we like, in my opinion. I think one other thing I would say, I mean, I mentioned wind. That's one of those sectors that will just be hard to do international trade with because of the size that you're dealing with. We're tracking new manufacturing announcements for nacelles. And almost all of them are in China still. And that's because of the challenges we're seeing in wind deployment in US and Europe. If you start to improve the opportunities for deployment in these countries, manufacturing will likely follow, depending on the systems that you're setting up. But we're, just, we're still at the point where it's hard to develop. Mm. Final question on electrification. Gaining speed sector by sector to use. Um, what are the main drivers behind that demand? Uh, uh, let's. Uh... And this a bit optimistic. <laughs> I, th I think the, the, the sector to mention is really uh, electrification of transport, where, where EVs really are, are gaining speed. There, are more, there will be more EVs sold globally in 2023 than the total sale of uh, EVs from 2010 to 2020. And the numbers are increasing. And we also see the forecast for 2030 for EV sales globally has increased dramatically just the last year. So, so this is kicking in uh, definitively. And the next I would like to mention, which I think is the next one, is, is uh, electrification of heating, which is also where, where the heat pumps can uh, both provide energy efficiency, a better climate solution, and are more economic in many cases than, than uh, heating with fossils. Mm. We're on time, but uh, a final remark from our uh, friend and, and guest, Meredith. Yeah, no, those are the two big ones for sure. I think with heat pumps especially, what you're seeing is pent-up demand. There's not enough installers right now. Mm. There's not enough manufacturing supply chains in Europe to meet the demand that's coming in from households, yep. especially since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, EVs, we expect to rise 34% year on year for sales this year. That's the big driver for new electrification. But you know, I wouldn't rule out industry. I think um, the mandates that have come out of the European Union for ammonia um, and for road transport are both really interesting and big opportunities to see increased electrification, potentially through hydrogen mm -hmm. of those sectors. Thank you so much for both of you. They're available in the break because now it's time for coffee. Uh, so please be back here in 20 minutes, uh, 1.35. Time for coffee. Thank you. Thank you.
Vi skal nå eh, dykke enda dypere in i det skiftet både Norge og Europa står overfor. For det er et skifte når det gjelder klima og energi, eh, men også digitalt. Hva må til for å lykkes, og hva må vi være oppmerksomme på? Hvordan kan vi forberede oss? Det er alle spørsmål som vår neste innleder skal hjelpe oss å besvare. Også til denne sesjonen så vil det være mulig å sende inn spørsmål gjennom Slido. David Victor is a, a professor of innovation and public policy at the University of California. He is an author, he is a lecturer, and one of the most renowned scientists within climate and energy politics. He is known for establishing, uh, uh, challenging established truths, and today he will provide us perspectives on the energy transformation that the world needs to deliver on. We are very excited to have you here, Professor. Stage is yours. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Maruk, and thank you, Christian, and your colleagues for having me here. Uh, I live in California. We like to think of ourselves as leaders on everything. Um, uh, but it's really interesting to come to Norway, as I've been doing for the last 30 years, and see what is happening here with regard to leadership on uh, issues around around energy. So what I want to talk today about is about executing on the energy transition. Um, and, and what does this mean in practice? What do we need to be, get, what do we need to be ready to, to, to do? I think the first point I want to make is that the energy transition is now underway and decisively uh, underway. It's not underway everywhere in the world. And when you look at the global data, we have up here on the on a chart that shows on the left-hand side the global energy system, the carbon intensity of the global energy system since the year 1800 hasn't changed very much, certainly not in the last few decades. On the right-hand side, we have the energy intensity or the emission intensity of the electric power system in the Western countries, Western industrial democracies, the OECD and the non-OECD, changing a little bit, reducing a little bit. The global picture does not yet show how much the energy transition uh, is, is underway. And that's for the reasons that Meredith talked about earlier. In a lot of the world, it's really hard to still build things. A lot of the world, frankly, isn't doing very much that's different from what it was doing before. But in parts of the world, including Norway, the transition is underway in a, in a, in a, major, uh, in a major respect. And that's not surprising, because global revolutions don't happen by global committee, much as the UN might tell us otherwise. Global revolutions start in small places, and then they spread out from those small places. And you can see that here on the left side with regard to the production of renewable electricity. You see lots of different countries not only Norway, but Spain, Germany, uh, the UK, California, this kind of rapid rise in, in the introduction of renewable power. Those of you who study technological change or those of you who study viruses, the math is the same. It's an S-shaped curve. It's in the process of taking off very rapidly, consuming much larger market share as the technologies mature and become much more competitive. On the right-hand side is the introduction of electric vehicles, where the experience in Norway is just unparalleled. We now in California are catching up very rapidly. Uh, we'll, we'll get there eventually. But you see the same picture. Some markets where this energy transition is beginning to happen, uh, and that tells us a lot about how it might unfold in the future. And what I want to do today is say three things that we've now learned about the energy transition um, that are, I think, of paramount importance as we think about what does this mean for the future of the global economy and ultimately for the future of the global climate. The first of the three things I want to talk about is electricity. I'm an academic. Um, academics are in the disagreement business. It's a perpetual employment program by disagreeing with everybody else. Um, uh, and so nobody wins a Nobel Prize by agreeing with everybody else. You win Nobel Prizes by disagreeing. But one of the few areas where almost all of the energy analysts agree now is that an economy that decarbonizes is an economy that electrifies. It's an economy that shifts to electric power in a pretty uh, major way. Let me show you some data. Uh, here's uh, uh, data from, that Stockcraft has put together. It's projection on the left-hand side where we are uh, right now with regard to electric power consumption, the vertical axis. The, and then over time, their projections suggest that as we add industry and as we, as we add buildings, as we add transportation, we decarbonize transportation through electrification, 
eventually uh, maybe other uses for long distance and, uh, and heavy transportation. As we make a lot of hydrogen, presumably green hydrogen from renewable, renewable power via electrolyzers, that the overall net effect is going to be roughly a doubling of electric power consumption uh, inside, uh, inside Norway. That's a typical result we see all around the world. It's roughly a doubling of the electric power system. This is really transformative because in most of the world, Western world at least, electric power systems have not been expanding very much. They've been growing very slowly. We've kind of forgotten how to build things. We've forgotten about how to build power lines, get them sited. This is now a huge uh, challenge in many different respects. So roughly doubling, uh, plus or minus, is one of the major implications. With that, with a much greater dependence on electricity, and in particular electricity made with renewable power, will come challenges that will be different in different parts of the world, but are going to rhyme all around the world. Let me show you the one that I'm most worried about, which is uh, uh, reliability. This is, some chart, this is some data from the UK, which is undergoing the same experience. They've shifted from a grid over the last 15 years that had still coal on it, a lot of nuclear power on it and a lot of natural gas to one that's really dominated by wind power. And with that has come a reduction in what's called inertia. The blue dots are the inertia on the uh, grid system as a function of the amount of power being consumed. Uh, in 2009, the red dots are a way of measuring inertia on the grid system roughly today. This comes from the grid operator in the UK. Why do you care about this? You care about this because traditionally, one of the main sources of reliability in grids was spinning metal the inertia, the physical inertia of spinning metal. As we move to grids that have more uh, renewable power, which are inverter-based technologies, so they don't automatically generate their own inertia, and also to grids that have um, uh, uh, lots of interconnections with other uh, parts of the world, inertia automatically does not rise. In fact, inertia could be one of the major challenges. And more generally, the challenge we're gonna be dealing with is the challenge of making sure that the lights stay on. Not only that electricity is affordable, but that it stays on. Uh, I live in California. We've been doing a lot of work on the same kind of challenge in California. This is from a major study that came out about a year ago showing how could we build a grid in California that keeps the same level of reliability that we have today, but is almost all renewables, has zero emissions. It took uh, nine months longer to figure the, out the answer to that question because our power flow models are not really designed to answer that question. It's such an unusual and difficult question to answer. If you look in the middle there, what you see is a huge increase in the uh, nameplate capacity and the, uh, the generators that are built in the state in order to keep the lights on. Roughly a five-fold increase in those generators, even though the grid itself, the power consumption only doubles. Why? This is the story we see over and over and over again around the world, which is that as you shift to renewables, you have to overbuild these systems, and the value then of being able to export that power, I know this is a debate that's underway here, the ability to export that extra power when it's not needed at home, that ability is of incredible, uh, incredible importance in, indeed. One of the other things we've learned is that very small amounts of reliable power that can be dispatched all the time, such as from hydrogen or such as from, from hydro in the, in the uh, Norwegian system, the value of that power is extremely high high because you have lots of renewables, often overproduction from renewables, but you have to guarantee uh, dispatch of power every hour uh, of every day in order to keep the lights on. Um, our governor uh, in the year 2000 learned what happens when you are presiding over a system that doesn't keep the lights on reliably, which is that there are enormous political and economic consequences. The second thing I want to talk about is exactly that. What does a world that makes progress on deep decarbonization, on the energy transition, what does it look like in terms of uh, economic uh, competitiveness? And I'd like to contrast that with the world that we're now leaving. The world that we're leaving is one where the backbone of energy was oil, and where oil, for all the political challenges of oil, oil is relatively easy to move around. It costs two or three dollars a barrel, plus or minus, to move uh, a, a barrel of oil very, very long distances. In a world where the oil itself can fetch many uh, tens of dollars per barrel or more than hundred dollars a barrel. So, in effect, the world was energetically flat. Roughly speaking, all around the world you saw roughly similar energy prices, and there were not massive differences in economic competitiveness as a result of the cost of energy. I'd like to suggest to you today that we are headed into a different world, a world that is going to be a lot less flat, a lot hillier, and, uh, and with deeper valleys, because the cost of energy is going to vary so much around the world, and the, the value of infrastructure in moving that energy around is going to rise enormously. If you believe it's going to be hard to build infrastructure, and all of us are now living that world where it has been hard to build infrastructure, if you believe that, 
then um, uh, that suggests to, the, to us that, it's gonna, that those costs, those difficulties, are going to translate ultimately into economic competitiveness. Let me show you a little bit of data to give you a sense of where we're headed. This is a study done by a German research institution. And Germany is a very interesting country to look at when, it, when you think about the changing economic geography because of the cost of energy, because Germany, of all the major economies in Europe, is arguably the most exposed. And what this shows is the cost of generating electricity at the margin uh, out in the tw year 2040s as, as we comply with European norms and as emissions come way down. And you see Norway kind of near the left, and then you see Germany way over on the right, uh, 25, 30 percent more expensive than, than power in, in Norway, and a lot more expensive than other, uh, other, other potential sources of uh, other countries that could post industry. Why do you care about this? You care about this because we expect that electricity and other clean energy carriers are going to be central to industry, and we found it really difficult already to site uh, and, and deploy those clean energy systems. The steel industry has been much in the news. And so from the same group, here's a study that looks at what happens to the cost of steel made in Germany as you think about different kinds of scenarios. On the left-hand side, this is what happens if you import hydrogen into Germany and then you just keep making the steel the same way but you use hydrogen to reduce the iron. The answer is the cost, actually for every country except for Norway uh, as a source of hydrogen, the cost of steel made in Germany goes up radically. Alternative, you could bring in uh, reduced iron already. So reduce the iron in other countries, bring it in as an intermediate product, and then make steel in Germany. Costs go up a little bit. But the cheapest thing to do is just to stop producing steel in Germany and instead to produce steel in other places and import it. Every country is going to face these kinds of questions, and these questions are going to become much more salient and difficult to answer because the world is going to be energetically less flat. It's going to be much hillier. And we are going to depend in a way that we are not yet used to uh, for our economic competitiveness on the cost of uh, clean energy, mainly electricity, possibly uh, also hydrogen. Um, this is the same slide that I showed in the beginning, some kind of overview of what some of the major challenges are, but I've got one more bullet on the bottom, and I just want to make one more point here, which is most of the energy transition that we're talking about today got started in a world where the cost of capital was very, very low almost free, or in Japan it was more than free. They were giving, paying you to take capital off the central bank's hands. We are in a different world right now, not just inflation, but the cost of capital. We're in a world where the cost of capital is higher, where the intention to risk is much greater than it used to be, where in countries like Norway, countries in the United States, other very well-managed, for all of our flaws in the United States, reasonably well-managed economically, um, for, uh, in those countries the cost of capital has gone up a bit, in the emerging economies that we're also very concerned about, the cost of capital has gone up radically. The delta between the well-managed countries and the less well-managed countries, that delta has gone up enormously. Why do you care about this? Everything that's interesting when it comes to the energy transition is capital intensive, even more capital intensive than the energy systems of uh, years past. And the third and last thing I want to talk about is uncertainty. It was mentioned in the previous panel that there's a lot of uncertainties uh, out there in various, uh, in various ways. I believe we have not begun to grapple seriously with uncertainty and the consequences. We usually show a couple of scenarios. We say, hey, we've been thinking about uncertainty, and then we ignore that. We go back to looking at just one set, one set of scenarios. We've got to stop doing that. <laughs> stop, please. Because in a world where everything that's interesting is capital intensive, that's a world where the uncertainty and the credibility of policies and so on play a much bigger role on what we actually invest in. So let me tell you a brief story about parking in California. And I know you think he's an academic. All academics like talking about the parking rules on campus because they have nothing else to tell you about. But, and that may be true. But we're in the middle of running, actually this week we're running experiments. We're doing a series of experiments on humans to try and understand how they charge their electric vehicles. Why do you care about that? Because a huge amount of the increase in power consumption around the world as we decarbonize the economy is going to come from vehicles. And one of the great unknowns is how will people, when and where will people actually charge? I know this is a question of great importance here in Norway. In California it's extremely important because right now almost everybody charges at home. Because why? Because they're rich people, they own their house, they park their Tesla in the driveway and they plug it in at night. And then they drive to the office and they come back home and they think they're saving the environment and they're helping. But <laughs> the marginal emissions associated with power in California are zero in the middle of the day because we're a solar dominated grid. 
wind-dominated grids, they tend to be zero at night. Solar-dominated grids, they tend to be zero in the middle of the day. And so we have a challenge of how do we move charging from home to the workplace. That's why parking rules matter so much. We are running experiments on campus where we have some devices that have four-hour parking rules, as shown on the left. Some devices have up to 12-hour parking rules. The curves look similar because people don't organize their lives around parking, shocking as it may sound. They organize their lives around family and around work and other things like that. But the tail on the right-hand side is longer, which means that some of our vehicles stay on campus longer and stay in the parking spot plugged into the grid. That matters because we've been able to figure out how to optimize their charging such that more than 80% of the electrons we supply to those vehicles that are parked in those stalls where they connect, that's a human behavior decision, and then we take over technologically, we can de deliver them at essentially zero marginal emissions. And so we have radically reduced emissions through a combination of human behavioral choices where we frankly didn't know until we started these experiments, and then also technological choices. Uh, I think you're seeing this now uh, here in Norway. This is a terrific study that came out earlier this year from McKinsey that looked at the volume of power supplied by different kinds of chargers in Norway, on-the-go chargers, destination chargers, work, home chargers, and so on. That's the top bar. The bottom shows the, uh, one way of measuring the economic value from those chargers. What's interesting here is that the chargers that are providing maximum convenience for where people take their cars, uh, whether it's uh, destination charging or on-the-go uh, charging, the value to the society of those chargers is much greater, and the scarcity is greater, in part because we haven't figured out the business models. And this is the larger point I want to make, is that in every single interesting aspect of the energy transition, we have profound human behavioral uncertainties that are as important as the technological uh, uncertainties that we were talking about before. We have a tendency as engineers to zero in on talk about the technological uncertainties, but I think the behavioral uncertainties are going to be very important. CCS is another one where the same story is, is true. This is a, a study that was published in a, in a buried in an academic journal a couple of years ago from a bunch of us who studied the fate of carbon capture and storage projects around the world. We said, we went out and looked at all the carbon capture and storage projects that any company ever imagined building, and then we tracked to see which of them actually survived and got built, and which of them died. And on the left-hand side are power projects, electric power projects. 95% of the CCS projects envisioned in the world in the power sector die. On the right-hand side are gas processing projects, 70% of them survive. What's the difference between the two? The difference between the two is the intuition behind the slide from BNEF earlier today that showed this huge surge in, in spending on renewables and on electricity. In gas processing projects, the business model around CCS is a debt-based, low-risk, high-reliability business model, and so people can deploy large amounts of capital in them. Whereas in the power sector, in the industrial sector, it's still too risky. It's why projects like what you're doing with Northern Lights are so important. Because there are lots of people lining up to build the fifth of a kind project. Nobody, almost nobody is lining up to build the first of a kind project. And that's one of the roles of government. And what you're seeing is over and over and over again, the same story is repeating itself. It's rhyming where we're envisioning, we're imagining all kinds of cool things as engineers that can happen with the energy transition, and then we don't see them because somehow people are not behaving the way we think engineers, as engineers, we think people should be behaving. And a large part of this is that people don't have confidence in the environment because the risks are too high and the behavioral changes are too, too great. I want to close by coming back to the slide that I showed earlier that gave us some good news. There's a huge amount of good news. Uh, in the world these days um, around the energy transition. It's happening, not everywhere, but it's happening in niches. And that's where I like to close. In 1990, when we started talking about the climate change problem, about one third of global emissions came from countries that would end up being reliable leaders on climate change, like Norway and the rest of Europe, like half of America, two thirds of Canada, Japan, a few other places. So that's shown in the green wedge here. Had we gotten serious then, maybe we would have made big progress. We weren't that serious. We were very good at going to meetings, not very good at actually solving the problem. What's happened over time is the green wedge has gotten smaller. The leaders have become, ironically, less relevant to the climate change problem because they have led. They've gone off and done things and their emissions are shrinking. And this is where I'd like to end, to say that for all our talk about leadership in California and in Norway, the leadership is essential, it's what creates new industries. But the essence of the climate change problem is not a leadership problem, it's a followership problem. We have to do things here 
that don't stay here, that become models, that become mimicked around the world because that's how you get the global emissions down and how you slow down ultimately the global accumulation of carbon dioxide. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, we have some questions from the audience and, and I also just wanted to follow up. You spoke a lot about uncertainty. Uh, what would be your main uh, advice on how to prepare for investment strategies in such a time? Yeah, I think we need to do a couple things. First, we need to really pay attention to the things we don't know. This scenario analysis where we tend to focus on singular scenarios as opposed to really doing robustness checks on the tails of distributions, that's, we gotta start thinking that way and looking about the things that we, that we don't know. The second thing I found very important is some companies are highly motivated to act. Some governments are highly motivated to act. The way we're really making progress on the climate problem is that those two are getting together and they're running experiments. In effect, they're demonstrating how new things happen and those experiments then make followership possible. They radically reduce uncertainty. We have a question. Which uh, energy-related topics do you think will be most important in the lead-up to the U.S. election next year? The cost of energy. I, I have to apologize to the world. We're about to go through a bizarre spectacle. I know it happens every four years, but this will redefine the baseline for bizarre. Um, presidential, nobody really knows whether the president does a good job or a bad job. So, so when you have a large country and you have a, a single leader, they're typically a referenda on whether the leader's doing a good job. So the cost of energy and inflation are going to, of which inflation is not entirely energy, but a lot of it is energy, uh, that's going to have a big impact because it'll, be, it'll, it'll send a signal as to whether people feel like the country's doing well. And uh, I have a question about future skill, uh, skills needs. What uh, do you think would be the most uh, valuable skill in the future? Well, I think, first of all, this is, this is the great era for electrical engineering and also chemical engineering. A lot of these projects are chemical engineering projects. I think a there are two things in this energy transition that I think have been underappreciated. One is the role of finance. In a world where you depend more on electricity and where electricity prices are more volatile, I think we've just seen the beginning, where they're more volatile and the value of clean firm power is greater, is a world where the posted prices are highly volatile and therefore the financial packaging of energy services becomes much more important. Not just for big consumers, but also for small consumers, we've got to find a way to, to deal with that. So actually, our, the role of finance here is, is great. I think one of the big wild cards, but potentially very important, is, is around data science. As it was discussed earlier, we were talking about digitalization. Some of these challenges of grid management could be addressed with AI, for example, or guided, more guided AI, because every grid is different, so you need to take the lessons that are, that are crowdsourced and then apply them to your own grid. One of the things I'm concerned about is that people think that AI is going to be a kind of panacea for the energy transition. AI does not have, does not have a carbon bias. It does not automatically believe the world should have lower emissions or higher emissions. And so all the things that are going on in AI that make it possible to run modern grids more reliably also make it possible to find and exploit oil more, more reliably. It makes it fun, uh, easier to exploit coal resources, like managing the explosives at the face of a coal seam is a very complicated problem, much easier to solve with AI. So we have to recognize that the technological revolutions in digitalization on their own won't fix the problem, the carbon problem for us. We need really clear signals to do that. Yeah, could you elaborate a bit more on the role of uh, AI? Because we have a lot of questions on that. Yeah, I think one of the most promising things in AI is gonna be around uh, grid management, especially decentralized grid management. One of the challenges right now that grid operator has is they have a hard time seeing the entire grid and they have a hard time predicting exactly what's gonna be going on in the grid. And so you do lots of simulations and all that becomes even harder when more of the grid is decentralized. So it looks likely that we're gonna to move to a system that is more, that, that where grid controls are, are semi-autonomous, but they're gonna need lots of updating with real world conditions. And that's a problem that topologically is ideally suited for AI. Then there is a question about public acceptance. How much are we being slowed down by the lack of public acceptance? Well, public, a lot. Yeah. Um, but it's like, get over it. Um, you know, it's, it's um, we also call that democracy. Um, <laughs> I, Luckily I, or unfortunately, I well, don't. I think also, frankly, 
A lot of people are talking about siting reform. My country right now is going through a huge discussion about siting reform, and I know there's been big challenges around siting wind. My guess is we're going to radically underbuild onshore wind compared to most projections and be forced to overbuild offshore wind for, that, for exactly those reasons. So I would, I'd go short on onshore wind for, for that. Um, I'm very, very concerned that there are a lot of legitimate things around public accept, uh, acceptance and public concerns that a lot of the siting reforms try to paper over. And that's not sustainable politically. So I think citing reform is, citing problems, if anything, are going to get harder with time, and they're unavoidable. And then we can take a last question here. The green shift requires both large and bold decisions by politicians and industry. Are we seeing these decisions being made? Yeah, I'm, look, look at my country. A year ago, I don't think anybody would have predicted something on the scale of, the, of what's called ERA, I guess, because to not, not confuse it with the other IRA, which is, has a different business model. Um, I, I think there's a lot of bold decisions. Um, I'm very, very concerned about implementation. And just let me give you two, two examples. One is I'm concerned that people are overstating what they know, and so they're understating the need for experiments and adjusting and adaptation and so on. This, point about uncertainty. The other thing that I'll say is, and my country is now Exhibit A, we are understating the collateral damage that will happen if we move too quickly as individual countries. What we've done with the ERA is now creating shockwaves around the world as more companies relocate to the United States and as the investment flow goes to the United States. And I understand politically why that's expedient in the United States, but it is not how you hold together an open trading and investment system. And people forget to their peril that what has made the energy transition work so far, like solar, what made solar cheap is because solar was a global technology. The frontier moved around the world, but because the markets were open, we could all gain advantage from that. And some of the cost raise that, that Merida was talking about earlier is from a bunch of supply chains and other problems and so on that are because people are stop, stop, have lost faith in the globalist system. And I'm an unabashed globalist in this sense. Professor David Victor, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Our next guest, she represents uh, 7 million industrial workers in 39 countries in Europe. Judith curtin darling is Deputy General Secretary at uh, Industrial Europe. She was formerly a Labour member of the European Parliament for North East of England. And she has been active within the trade union movement for over 20 years. Today, she will be sharing her views on the two transitions we are facing, the green one and the digital one, and also how they will affect uh, the workers of the future and the skills needs. Thanks very much. And um, first of all, uh, can I say thank you very much for um, inviting the trade union movement uh, to speak at this conference because all too often we're talked about uh, but we're not in the room and we're definitely not on the podium giving our view so already I think that's a extremely welcome um, uh, signal and um, and it has to be acknowledged from our members' perspective, right across 39 European countries, what's clear is that we're embarked on an industrial revolution. Um, and many of our members already feel that they are being pulled and, and uh, they're on the rolling waves of the changes which are, are going on in different uh, sectors. As a result of COVID, and I'm surprised that the pandemic has barely been mentioned, uh, as if it has already been forgotten, but as a result of the pandemic, what we've seen is an acceleration of uh, the change. And what was two slightly separate, uh, but distinctly separate transitions, the energy or the climate transition and the digital transition, as a result of uh, the pandemic, those two transitions are increasingly entwined. Um, and one is accelerating the other, 
uh, potentially offering solutions, but also um, uh, creating challenges uh, for the other. So I think it's very difficult for us as um, energy industrial workers uh, to talk about a single transition. We increasingly talk about this uh, twin transition. At the same time, and it was mentioned earlier, we have an extremely volatile situation for ordinary people across Europe. Um, the energy price crisis, the impact on inflation, the cost of living crisis uh, has been felt right across Europe and um, many of our policies have come up wanting uh, because we have a lack of uh, social uh, agenda around it. So there are major implications for workers in this whole uh, discussion and the context is extremely complicated and that's why my first major message to you is the absolute importance of not seeing the social dimension of seeing humans as an added extra on awkward topic that has to be considered but as seeing it as a fundamental bedrock of policy making. If our policy making was not about climate neutrality, but had just transition right as its top objective, we would organize our policies differently. It was said just now, technology is super sexy. Everybody, every politician wants to wear a high vis. I'm very cautious saying every politician because I was a politician. Uh, but every politician wants to cut a ribbon, be, see exciting shiny steel, uh, see a new technology. Very few politicians want to talk about the grind of collective bargaining, of sitting around negotiation tables, of working out how you find trade-offs to ensure that everybody is on this journey together. But that is absolutely crucial because actually today, the social dimension is the Achilles heel of our whole Green Deal for three reasons in my view. The first is we have a very tight labour market. We have more vacancies than, um, uh, than job seekers. Many of those vacancies are low quality jobs. It has to be said, according to data from the OECD and, and elsewhere. We have a demographic pyramid in many of our industries, which is awful. An ageing society and too few people coming into the sector. We like to talk about the people coming in at, who are coming in at the start of their jobs. We have falling apprentice rate, apprenticeship rates across Europe. We have falling levels, access for graduate um, young people coming into industry. But we also don't have the pathways for workers from other sectors to come into industry in the energy sector. We can't fill, and I apologize to many in the room, we won't be able to achieve a closure of the skills gaps that we face and the labour shortages with white men alone. We need to have more women in industry and we need to have pathways for people from different um, backgrounds, from different parts of society into, um, into our sectors if we're to address these labour shortages and the demographic challenges um, that we face. We have report after report of how damaging these labour shortages are. The latest European Investment Bank report showed that a staggering 85% of companies have not been able to implement investment decisions because of labour shortages. This is critical. We're very happy talking about critical raw materials, what time is spent for critical workers for the, the labour shortages that we have in our, in our society? That's the first point. The second point is, at the same time as the kind of ongoing running of our industries, we have um, this colossal industrial revolution scale challenge of reskilling and upskilling the workforce. The numbers are enormous. To, to reach the Repower EU targets, we need to move from a workforce in renewable energy of 1.2 million today to 3.5 million by 2030. But we have barely a plan of how to do it as a continent. We have voluntary initiatives. We have a coalition of the willing in terms of skills and in terms of, of workers. But we don't have a strategy, a common strategy, about how we do this. 
Look at the battery sector, virtually no one today, 800,000 workers by 2030. The automotive, lots of focus has been on electrification of transport. To reach that electrification, we need to see the reskilling and upskilling of 2.4 million automotive workers by 2020, 2030, sorry, in the uh, car sector alone. Uh, to look at the supply chains, we need to see the upskilling and reskilling of 7 million workers in energy intensive industries. If we're talking in the Net Zero um, Industry Act at European level about bringing back supply chains to Europe, we can only do that if we have a workforce which is able to build, to manufacture, to install, to um, maintain and, and manage uh, those technologies. And yet, this is seen as a solution which will be delivered by the market. Well, my message is that the market will not deliver the social dimension. We need public policies, we need social dialogue, working industry and unions together, and we need to do it quickly for the third reason. Social acceptance in Europe is falling for the Green Deal. If we look at election results across Europe, what we're seeing is the, a backlash building around grievances which are actually, in some cases, very, not related to the green transition itself. But political parties and populists using the green transition, using the anxiety and the uncertainty of the future to mobilise on the shop floor. And I can tell you as a union leader, one of the key messages that we get back from shop stewards in multinational companies and in our, our working groups and in talks with unions is the absolute fear of the far right mobilising across Europe. And the fact that not only will this delay uh, what needs to happen, but it will make the transition when it comes 100 times more brutal than it needs to be if we're able to put in place the framework um, for just transition today. So what do we want? I have three minutes, so I will try to be very quick because it's a long list, but <laughs> you can find it if you're interested. We, after a series of two years work with unions right across Europe, across the energy, industrial, manufacturing, and mining sectors, we developed a common set of demands which are applicable at the national level, at the regional level, and at the European level. This is for a framework in Europe on just transition. It's about changing workers from being the recipients of decisions, strategic corporate decisions, public policy decisions, into actors in their own destiny. It's about making proactive rights to participation. Get your workforce at the table at the beginning of the process. In that way, you buy in the social acceptance. Ensure the framework for retraining and upskilling by an individual right for every worker to reskilling and retraining with recognition of informal and formal qualifications so that job-to-job -job transitions are smoother for workers, not just within the same company or within the same sector, but within regions, across sectors, across companies, and so on, so that the workers are not the reason why companies can't grow and deliver their, um, their investment uh, plans or um, products. We need to ensure uh, that um, this isn't just about the sexy parts of the workforce. In fact, the skills gaps are largely in the, it, they're right across the whole of the workforce, from electricians, installers, to metal workers, to engineers, chemical engineers, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers. So we need to have a strategy which doesn't pick out the beauty um, spots, but really looks at the whole um, economy as a whole. And we have concrete examples. I haven't got time to go into them, but you can find them all um, online. We're building a database of how people are doing it well. But look across the border into Sweden. In last summer, they adopted interprofessional uh, collective agreements at the, level, at the national level, together with legislation which ensured the financing to deliver this kind of radical just transition framework for the, the Swedish workforce. So the examples exist. We need to learn from each other and we need to ensure that they spread right across Europe. My last point, the third point, but it's a cloud that we see on the horizon. All too often, the cost of investing in people is seen as a cost economically, 
in companies and at state level. If we take that approach, and at the moment Europe is developing new fiscal rules, which will bring in a new period of austerity for many countries across Europe, we will really hamper, not just um, slow down the, um, the energy transition, but we will completely undermine the social acceptance which is necessary to deliver it. And therefore, we need to ensure that the macroeconomic framework is in place as well. And lots of things, I mean, you put a, an American up and then a Brit in the context of politics where, you know, we're competing for how bonkers we are. Um, but um, if you look at what's going on in the US, what the Biden administration have done is they have pulled together a climate strategy with an industrial strategy, with social conditionality weaved right through the middle of it to guarantee the social acceptance of the population. That's what we need to be doing in Europe. That's what we need companies to be joining us in calling for. We're here to at your invitation to give you our views, but please be with us when we're demanding this at European level so that we can ensure that this energy transition is a transition which doesn't slow down because we know that to get to 2050, the action needs to be in this decade. And if we miss this decade, the transition will be brutal for many in Europe and that will undermine our uh, societies on a high level, but also our climate and energy objectives. Thanks very much. Thank you very much to Judith Curtin, darling, about just transition. Uh, vi ska over till uh, Norsk. Kjetil Digre har varit uh, koncernchef i Aker Solutions uh, sedan 2020. Han har bred erfaring från olje- och gasindustrin och han menar att det haster med att få fram fler energiprojekt. Lika viktig menar han att det är att skapa en lönsam leverantörindustri. Hur kan utbygging av ny energi bidra till att säkra lönsamhet över hela värdekedjan i Norge och vad är status på kapaciteten i infrastrukturen till industrin? Den samma industrin som i stor grad ska sørge för att vi når de mål och ambitioner som är satt av energikommissionen. Välkommen se till Digre. Thank you. Uh, I thought actually after uh, uh, American and, and the Brit that I should be a Norwegian trying to speak in, uh, this, uh, telling you about this in, in English, so I'll, I'll do that attempt. Thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, I think uh, it's, it's excellent to have an opportunity to try to give you some high level uh, thoughts uh, from the supplier's chair when we are now right in the middle of both the oil and gas activity peak in Norway, but then also trying to transition into having a relevant role in, uh, in the renewable space. Uh, just echo then what Judith said, many parts of that is right at the core of what we are uh, dealing with as well, you know, just transition being part of how we are driven into looking at both organizational development and competence and diversity and inclusion. Uh, this, this, picture from, uh, this is a picture from our uh, stored yard. Uh, uh, showing the towing of one of the 11 floating concrete holes that we delivered to Equinor's Hive and Tampen project recently. This is the world's largest floating wind farm, and each of the 11 foundations are 170 meters, 107 meters tall. And the turbines which we later then installed on top of these holes have an additional height of about 148 meters. I'm an engineer, so that's uh, you know the reason why I mentioned it is to try to explain the type of industrial tasks that we are talking about when we are trying to scale this industry uh, from the existing uh, uh, knowledge and assets in, uh, in Norway to create uh, uh, valuable industrial uh, value chains. So, uh, Kraft or Handlekraft is really an appropriate title for the abilities we must use uh, and the priorities we must make in the energy transition we are facing. And it's, it's obvious that a growing energy production on one side needs to be met by a parallel industrial uh, development. So then let's uh, first start by telling you a little bit more about who we are. We are around 16,000 employees globally, with approximately 9,000 of these being in, uh, in Norway. 
And we are spread over 14 locations from north to uh, south in, uh, in the country. And we are a global supplier to the whole energy market with capabilities and solutions to cover what we call the entire value chain uh, and also all the phases of an industry project. So our offering spans from expertise and consultancy in the early phases to delivery of complete facilities for production of energy across several of the new energy verticals, including operation and in the end decommissioning. Uh, we have a solid position within oil and gas. I think that's perhaps the, the best known one, but we are also using our experience to deliver solutions to enable production of low carbon uh, or ensure low carbon emissions. And at the same time, we are rapidly growing our business for delivering solutions for all parts of the CCS value chain. You mentioned Northern Lights. We are in all parts of that uh, value chain and longship project. And for renewable energy production like offshore wind, hydropower, which we recently restarted in Aker Solutions, and also hydrogen. And our targets for 25 and uh, 2030 reflects that we are taking part in the energy transition, really aiming at most of our growth coming in the, in the renewables uh, areas. And then it said more of everything faster is the message from the Norwegian Energy Commission. Uh, and it's uh, the need of 40 terawatt hours before 2030. You know, coming from oil and gas, you know, that is it's only seven years to approve, design, build, install, and start production of a range of these different energy setups. You know, and in, in, in oil and gas, you know, that you could look at uh, perhaps a similar figure being around, around 10 years. So the, the, the timeline here is really, I would call it, uh, hectic. Um, and as we see on this slide, both onshore wind and solar might be, you know, the winners in this. Uh, obviously, depending on both the democracy you talked about and, and, and where we uh, arrive at actually solving some of the critical issues there. Uh, I'm also quite confident that within hydropower, what we see now, if we are sort of joining forces, uh, authorities and, and the different stakeholders, we will be able to really add what is uh, the potential from there. But it's fundamental, you know, as you see in this graph, uh, that off offshore wind uh, must contribute with a key part. Uh, and then the perspectives from the commission is then for us as a company both uh, a huge challenge but obviously then also a huge opportunity and we want to do our part. Overall we must uh, uh, make offshore wind a priority and then we have to really meet several objectives uh, simultaneously. And the two first ones are uh, sort of no-brainers, and it's talked about by many here. Uh, you know, the deliver uh, new energy fast enough, uh, reach the climate objectives as good as we can. But the third one is that we must acknowledge that developing new energy projects is completely dependent on how we can develop an effective supplier industry. And this is not only important for Norway's domestic demand for more energy, but also for how we, as a nation, strategically position ourselves for international industry activities with high value creation. And you know, just now, even though we are on the forefront of many of the changes and, and you know, developments needed, uh, projects are really happening at a larger scale and, and paced uh, outside the Norwegian borders uh, for the moment. Uh, and I experience that the commitment is there from en energy companies, uh, from industry like ourselves and also policymakers. So what's important now is really to transfer these ambitions into you know, actual strategies and plans for the industry uh, and also then trigger projects. You know, 100 years ago, it's a story about uh, Norway combining uh, hydropower with the, with the growth of a, a new kind of industry and knowledge areas, including the supply industry. And then 50 years ago, you know, we did the same, I would say, where we radically took on the opportunity within oil and gas, not only to produce, but also to build and change and transform the industry and the society at, uh, at uh, large. Uh, and the existing supplier industry uh, provides a good foundation for growing new activities. It's a, it's, a, it's a sort of a daring change project to think that, you know, classical high-grade class of, of oil and gas industry solving the most complex tasks can be relevant for the much sort of lean, industrialized, standardized uh, new energy areas. Uh, but I think that's the best uh, starting point. Uh, and I think that we have to recognize that new industries, for example, offshore wind, requires that the supply industry can rapidly adapt and develop capabilities and expertise in a lot of key areas. And not the least, the supplier industry, both globally and in Norway, must significantly increase 
their capacity. And looking at capacity, the accumulated ambitions for offshore wind in Northwest Europe is to install 340 gigawatts before 2050. This means that we must build and install about 1,000 new uh, offshore wind turbines and foundations and associated infrastructure every year for the next decades. You saw uh, one of the High Wind Tampen foundations. I think we've spent two years of building 11 of those. And then that was a stretch. So then together building a thousand a year, that industry is not there. Uh, and then of this again, the Norwegian ambition is to install 30 gigawatts over the next decade. So only looking at Norway, we have to install about 80 to 100 uh, a year of all of this, which means really that you know, the, the industry ramp up that is needed uh, is, is quite dramatic. And uh, in the, in the previous uh, image also shows that there's, there are gaps you know, in most of these areas. And this is not only when we look at Norway solving Norwegian projects, it's also when we call on, on global uh, muscles in the same area. And then the question is, can we do this alone as a supply industry? I guess we can, but I don't think it will happen fast enough. And then the UK deserves credit for taking pole position in development of offshore wind. Uh, it's also a good foundation from, as a learning arena. But then on one hand, we um, noticed that the auctions for offshore wind licenses have resulted in 70% decline in, in CFD costs. But then this rate downwards has happened in parallel with you know, increasing uh, costs all over the board. Uh, and as you see in the graph in the middle there, players in the supplier industry are experiencing huge losses. So this is in the range of billions. And this is not sustainable, obviously. Uh, and the result is that uh, a lot of the relevant suppliers that should really build capacity and competence and, and be front runners. They're actually refraining from participating and bidding on many of these offshore wind, uh, wind projects. So on one hand, we, we need a lot of uh, projects and energy uh, uh, initiatives, but at the other hand, it needs a more sustainable commercial model and risk sharing with more sound margins and increased capacity. And then there are some key topics, just uh, to, I see I've run out of time here, I'm sorry for that. But the topic one is about the framework conditions, as I mentioned. They have to ensure sound profitability throughout the whole value chain. Uh, you know, and frame conditions could also lead uh, the way for more industrialized uh, setups and standardization, uh, which is vital for bringing down the cost. And then topic two uh, is, is really the demand for expanded capacities and capabilities. Our plans must take into account that we enter the largest in industrial uh, transformation in modern time, and we have to progress very quickly uh, to actually meet the, the ambitions as been stated, uh, stated before. And then topic three, we say that we should build on the best practice we have from developing both in hydropower and oil and gas, as I, as I mentioned. And then a success recipe in all of this, in my mind, is actually uh, to have a different kind of open uh, and, and uh, transparent collaboration across, across the board. You mentioned you know, the debt financing, uh, project financing. That has been uh, an, an issue which has really led to the, the sequence of things being that banks with developers, they cap the, 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 the deal and then they actually bring the, the risk at a too early uh, point in time onto the supply chain. So that has really been uh, one, one main reason for these projects being uh, not starting at the, at the right uh, starting point and, uh, and has led to huge losses uh, for many of the players. So then in conclusion, we say that we recognize um, we recognize the challenges in energy shift. Uh, it's a, the, the industry is not there, the capacity is not there, but we are doing projects in all these relevant uh, energy verticals. Uh, and from my side, I know that we are 16,000 colleagues that really believe that we can make a, make a difference here. We want to be part of it, uh, uh, and we want to do our share, but, but it's really a huge climb to, to actually meet up and, and, and meet the ambitions that are, are stated for, for us. So by that, uh, we sh I wish want to thank you for the attention. Vår neste innleder er Hilde Tonne. Hun er konsernsjef i Statnett og vil snakke om hvordan nettutbyggingen er selve nøkkelen for uh, omstilling og hvordan digitalisering og automatisering er en forutsetning for å lykkes. 
Tonne vil også snakke om Statnets fremtidige planer og massive investeringer, og så behovet for produksjon av mer kraft. Har vi et godt nok system rigget for det grønne skiftet? Det håper jeg at hun skal forsøke å svare på i sitt innlegg nå. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to copy Kjetil and do this in English as well as we prepared for that. So let's just go ahead. Um, I wanted to start by uh, saying it's a pleasure to be here. Everyone talks about the grid now. That's a bit unusual for us. We used to be the company where your girlfriend's father used to work. <laughs> Currently, we get much more attention than that. Um, we have two main tasks in a transmission system operator like Startnet. We um, plan, develop, operate, and own the transmission grid. Everybody knows that. And in addition to that, increasingly complex, we balance the power system. The power system moving into be more and more unregulated. That is a huge challenge. I want all of you to remember that when I go through what I would like to share with you. First of all, Net zero has been decided. Net zero 2050 is actually happening. It's by law, it's by obligation and ambition, but it's happening. The energy mix is changing as we sit here every day. We know that, we want that. What's interesting is to know that Norway for 40 years has been running and operating a renewable energy system. We can learn from that. The world can learn from that. Norway is the most electrified uh, country in the world. We are probably the most interconnected country in the world. We can learn from that. That does not mean that Norway is done. By far, it does not mean that. But it means that the world can learn from it. And we should spread that. First of all, what, are, what do we know? We know that in order to run a net zero based on renewable energy system, we need flexibility. We need all the flexibility we can get. We need the flexibility that we get from interconnectors with other countries. We need to get used to that. We need the flexibility that we get from um, flexible demand with everyone connected to the grid. Much more of that, we're a bit used to it in Norway, but much more of that everywhere. And we need the flexibility that we can get from cross-sector Electrolysis from hydrogen will probably be very central into the future, and batteries and other ways of storing and switching and creating flexibility. The third thing we need is automation, as was mentioned here. And currently we're doing that. We're in the middle, together with many colleagues all over Europe, but in the Nordic region currently, we're um, deploying a huge project called the Nordic Balancing Model, we're investing um, billions of years through that, uh, ensuring and utilizing artificial intelligence, machine learning, in order to go from intraday trading, intraday balancing, towards real time. It's not possible to run a renewable system like this without doing that. It's very complex to get there, but we're in the middle of it, and it will happen. So, the grid. Massive investments are happening. Massive investments are being planned. Only in Norway, Startnet is planning the next 10 years, or up towards 2030, investing close to 100 billion Norwegian kroners. 10 billion euros. And in, for the rest of the underlying grids, for the distribution companies, they plan the double. And in Europe as such, it's being planned close to 600 billion euro is in investments. And those of you who will know a little bit more about this, you know that Germany, for instance, just uh, issued their uh, grid development plan, uh, postulating close to 130 billion euros invested by 2045, 
in, in Germany only. There's so much money going into this. There's so much activity having to happen in order to deliver on the green transition. On top of this, because this was onshore, on top of this, we have the grid that will be needed in the North Sea if we start and continue to build offshore wind. And it's happening as we speak. Norway has, as was mentioned, the ambition of 30 gigawatts installed by 2040, 2050. That's a lot, that's doubling the energy system of today in Norway. And the rest of Europe, when you sum everything up, it will be 400 to 500 gigawatts of ambitions within 2050. It's a lot. And in order to get there, we need a grid, probably a meshed grid over time, including hybrids, including radials, including seeing the grid we see on shore coupled with a grid offshore. This needs to be operated. We need to balance what's happening out there. It's a huge task. So what is then being done? What's being done is we plan this according together with what we do on shore. We plan for an architecture and we collaborate with everyone from National Grid and Aginet in Denmark, Tenet in, uh, in the Netherlands and others. And the challenges are the supply industry is not there at all with the volume that is needed. The talents and uh, competences needed, including the technology development needed, is not there yet. And it's extremely important now that we get going on the regulatory basis that will be needed in having this across five to six different nations. So, the challenges are there, we're working on it, we will get there. But we need a clarification of the role of infrastructure, also coupled with the discussion we have on offshore wind in Norway. That's extremely important uh, for us to get started to work on this. I want you to see this triangle perspective. It seems easy, it seems uh, prosaic, but it's not. Because if you look at delivering on the climate targets that we have, or delivering on the security supply that we would like to have, we see that if you take off, look at grid, power, and demand together, it's not possible to take out one of the elements and still have the other two. And I think that's one thing we should take away today. It's not possible to think that we can have the power production needed without the grid. It's not possible that we can deliver on the industrial demand or the demand from people as such that is increasing like this without having the grid and the power. And it's not possible to invest in the grid with these massive investments without knowing that the demand is there. So what do we need to do? We need to think holistically. We need to think proactively and not reactively. And we need to be able to start these investments seeing this picture together. The demand in Norway, we can measure that because we are obligated to connect all demands that are needed. And we can measure that fairly systematically. And we see that we can deliver only, actually now, 60 to 70% of what is needed, including in what we have planned to do within 2050. We're working very hard on doing this quicker. We're working very hard on utilizing our current um, grid better than we do today. And we're working extremely hard on working with partners and others in order to move things quicker. But it's a challenge. So I want to end with this. I want all of you to remember, 2030 in our world is actually today, and 2050 is tomorrow. So we need to get going with finding the flexibility that a renewable system needs in order to balance this the good way. We need to invest massively in digital and automation in order to be able to do this. We're on the route to do that, and, and we will get there. We need to think holistically and proactively and I'm sensing a little bit in the discussion in Norway that this is getting there also with respect from the permitting side. Oh, and then I mentioned permitting. Permitting, permitting, permitting. Thank you so much for your attention.
Tusen hjertelig takk. Til vår neste sesjon skal vi nå få opp næringsminister Jan Kristian Vestre, stortingsrepresentant for Høyre Nikolai Astrup, Guri Melby fra Venstre, og vi skal snakke om realismen i å nå klimamålene, ikke minst også hva en energiomstilling krever av handling. Til denne sesjonen kan dere også stille spørsmål gjennom Slido som dere får opp her på skjermene nå. Og så tar vi de, så skal vi prøve å få satt deg litt tid i avslutningen og ta spørsmålene fra salen og de som sitter på kontoret eller hjemme også. Jeg vil starte med å spørre spørre litt om realismen i å nå klimamålene. Fra 2021 til 2022 så reduserte Norge klimagassutslippene bare 0,5 prosent. Hvis vi skal nå målene 2030 så må vi altså kutte hvert eneste år like mye som vi kuttet fra 1990 frem til i dag. Med det tempo, hvordan opplever dere at vi ligger an, Guri Melby? Jeg vil egentlig stjæle mine forkvinnes ord. Altså, vi må klare det. Vi har ikke noe valg. For det første så har vi inngått juridisk forpliktende avtaler med EU. Og i tillegg så er jo verden avhengig av at vi lykkes også med å nå klimamålene våre for å unngå for sterk global oppvarming. Men det er klart at det ser ikke akkurat lyst ut. Det tempoet vi har nå, det er alt for sakte. Og jeg synes heller ikke at regjeringen responderer godt nok når vi ser at resultatene ikke når opp til de målene vi har satt. Så synes jeg debatten mer handler om hva skal vi gjøre for å skru opp målene, kontra hva skal vi gjøre for å skru opp tiltakene som matcher de målene vi allerede har sagt. Så vi har ikke noe valg, men vi ligger dårlig an. Vi ligger dårlig an. Hva tenker du, Astrup? Hvis 2030 er i dag, så har vi et problem. Det er helt åpenbart. Men det er det heldigvis ikke, selv om Hilde Tone har helt rett i at det er veldig, veldig kort tid til, og vi må skynde oss for å få det til. Fremtiden er heldigvis ikke lineær, den må være eksponensiell og med det så mener jeg at vi må altså fase inn nye teknologier i et mye, mye høyere tempo enn det vi har gjort før og det kommer til, tror jeg, å skje veldig mye frem til 2030. Spørsmålet om det er nok og som Gura er inne på så har vi jo nå et juridisk rammeverk rundt klimaarbeidet vårt som er mye mer forpliktende enn det det noen gang har vært før og det betyr at det vil straffe seg også i den andre enden hvis ikke vi klarer å levere på dette. Men vanskelig det blir det. Men du tror ja. Nei, altså som sagt, vanskelig blir det. Det er mye som skal skje, og det er egentlig tre ting som jeg mener er viktig, som vi må ha på plass. Det ene er kraft, det andre er kapital, og det tredje er kompetanse. Og akkurat nå så sliter vi på alle tre. Vi skal snakke mer om det etterpå, men Vestre skal også få lov til å svare på det. Når vi klimamålene? Svaret er ja. Og det er ikke noe land i verden som har bedre forutsetninger enn oss for å få det til. Men vi kom i gang alt for sent. I 1990 så var Norge samlet utslipp 51 millioner tonn CO2. I 2021 var det 49 millioner tonn CO2. Vi har altså brukt 33 år på å kutte 2 millioner, eller 4 prosent av de 55 prosentene vi skal kutte frem til 2030. Det positive er at nå skjer det historisk mye på en gang. Og det som gjør meg mest begeistret er at det er drevet av det private næringslivet. Vi ser nå en rekordutbygging av nye prosjekter innenfor grønne industri. Aldri har vært investert mer i nye grønne verdikjeder. Det ligger nå an til en dobling av norsk kraftproduksjon de neste to-ti årene. Det er en forutsetning for å få til både klimamålene og omstilling av økonomien. Vi ser nå at kapital, både privat og statlig, vrir seg i mye grønnere retning. Vi er det første landet i verden som forventer at de statleide selskapene skal ha vitenskapsbaserte klimamål. Vi vrir nå hele innkjøpspolitikken, 650 milliarder i året, til å fremme grønn omstilling, vekte miljø med 30 prosent. Trapper opp CO2-avgift med 21 prosent bare i år. Aldri har vært høyere bevilgninger til Enova. Det skjer enormt mye på en gang. Men det er et stort etterslep, og jeg mener at vi kommer til å få det til, men vi trenger alle gode krefter på laget, og så må vi slutte å skape tvil om vi klarer det. Vi må heller se hva vi skal til for å få det til, og hvis vi ikke har identifisert nok tiltak nå for å klare det, så får vi pina å identifisere de siste tiltakene ASAP og iverksette dem. Men dere har likevel litt forskjellige innfallsvinkler på hvordan man skal løse det. Hva tenker du, Guri Melby, om hva som skiller dere som står her på scenen i dag? Altså... Jeg tror det som Nikolai Astrup oppsummerte med, altså kraft, kompetanse, kapital, det tror jeg vi alle kan stille oss bak, men så tror jeg vi har ganske ulike virkemidler for hva det er som skal til for å utløse det. 
Jeg tror for eksempel ikke at vi kan fortsette med den sterke satsingen på fossilindustrien, samtidig som vi skal bygge opp fornybar energinæringen så sterkt. Fordi det vil kreve kompetanse, og det vil kreve kapital. Og jeg synes jo det bildet som næringsministeren tegner opp med den her voldsomme oppblomstringen som skjer innenfor fornybar, ikke nødvendigvis helt stemmer med virkeligheten. Det vi så for eksempel da regjeringen kom med statsbudsjettet sitt i fjor, og et nytt skatteregime både for vindkraft og for vannkraft, var jo at veldig mange viktige investeringer stanset opp. Veldig mange prosjekter som kunne ha bidratt til å gi oss mer fornybar energi frem mot 2030, altså det som er det ganske sånn kortsiktige. Mange av de prosjektene er nå bremset opp, og vi har fortsatt ikke fått avklart hvordan de skattereglene skal være, og fortsatt så ligger mange av de prosjektene i skuffa. Mens det motsatte eksemplet da, hva var det som skjedde da oljenæringen sleit i 2020 for eksempel, var jo at vi fikk et bredt flertall for en subsidiepakke for oljenæringen, så nå har bidratt til at kapitalen og kompetansen har strømmet til oljenæringen. Det mener jeg er en feil prioritering, og det er ikke bare det at vi da øker verden utslipp med det, men vi forhindrer faktisk konkurransekraft for Norge innenfor fornybarnæringen, og det var kanskje det største skillet mellom Venstre på en side og Høyre og Arbeiderpartiet på andre siden. Så skal Vestre få svare på det samme, og så Astrup. Ja, jeg er enig i en del av det du sa, men vi må ha to tanker i hodet samtidig. Og nå står Europa i den største energikrisen på 50 år, og norsk eksport av gass er ikke bare avgjørende for europeisk energisikkerhet, det er helt avgjørende for europeisk stabilitet. I tillegg så bidrar naturgassen vår til å avkarbonisere energimarkedene i Europa gjennom i første omgang å erstatte kull, i annen omgang gjennom at vi kan konvertere den til blått hydrogen med karbonfangst og lagring. Det vil bidra til at vi forblir en industriell energistormakt og hjelper EU til å avkarbonisere energimarkedene sitt i 2050. Vi kan ikke gå fra fossil til fornybar over natta. Så det vi må sørge for nå er jo at denne omstillingen skjer tilbake gradvis, at vi bruker den fantastiske kompetansen vi har innenfor olje og gass. Vi har verdens beste offshore-fagarbeidere, ingeniører. Vi har en leverandørindustri som kan konkurrere med hele verden. Mange av dere er representert her i dag. Det er jo de vi nå skal skape tilbud for gjennom å lage etterspørsel etter nye grønne løsninger, blant annet innenfor offshore havvind. Og så er det jo mye av overskudden i olje og gass som er med på å finansiere det vi nå gjør på havvind og på alt det andre. Så her må vi altså gjøre begge deler på en gang. Begge deler, og så skal vi kanskje flere ting. Vi skal både samarbeide med andre land, vi skal bygge ut med energi, og vi skal sørge for et akseptabelt og levelig prisnivå også for nordmenn, Astrup. Absolutt, og nå er jeg på en gang skyld enig i veldig mye av det Jan Kristian sa, og det er ikke alltid er det. Han tegner jo gjerne et sånt glansbilde, og så blir han invitert til å ta del i hans verden. Og da han gikk på, så var det sånn at nå var det tid for handling, det var slutt på utredninger. Jeg vet ikke hvor mange offentlige utvalg det var siden, men det er i hvert fall, det er alltid veldig mye begeistring, og det er bra, for det kommer vi til å trenge. Vi trenger begeistring, vi trenger at alle er med, vi trenger privat sektor med. Dette er ikke noe offentlig sektor kan gjøre alene, men vi trenger altså at man rekker rent praktisk også har rammevilkår som gjør at det er noen som vil satse på ny kraftproduksjon, for eksempel. Og nå har vi da Sørlig Nordsjø 2, der kommer kraften, slik regjeringen legger opp til, i 2035, rundt der. Så har du vindkraft på land, der sier Finansdepartementet, det kommer ikke noe vindkraft på land innen 2030. Ingenting. Så har du oppgradering av vannkraftverk. Ja, det var 35 milliarder i prosjekter som lå på bordet. Så kom det et statsbudsjett, og nå er de av bordet. Så vi må altså koble festtalene på den ene siden med den praktiske handlingen på den andre siden og ha rammevilkår som gjør at dette lønner seg. Hvis ikke, så kommer det ikke til å skje. Men har vi det, så starter en snøball og rulle som ikke lar seg stanse. Da er det mulig å få til ny kraftproduksjon. Da er det mulig å kutte utslippene raskt. Da kan vi få til eksponensiell utvikling, og det trenger vi på alle disse områdene. Og da kommer vi også til å trenge privat kapital. Og det er helt avgjørende, og da må vi sørge for at det er attraktivt å være her, og investere her, og ta del i den veksten som må komme inn for en omstilling. Da skal Vestre få svare kort på det. Vi ser at vi sliter litt med tiden. Vi skal også rekke, nå har jeg sagt mange ganger at dere må sende inn spørsmål, og det renner inn her, så vi må rekke noen av de spørsmålene også, ellers så blir det et løftebrudd. Så Vestre skal få en kort kommentar, og så Melby. Vestre. Nå prøvde jeg å heve meg litt over dette og se hva vi var enige om. Men det er helt greit å diskutere på den måten der, hvis du har lyst til det. Det har aldri skjedd mer på utbygging av kraft til havs enn det de gjør nå. Vi skal bygge 1500 flytende havvindturbiner i neste to tiårene. Vi har aldri bevilget mer penger til energimyndighetene for å få ned tempo på konsesjonsbehandlingen av 
linjer på nett. Det var deres regjering som satte full stopp på vindkraftplanen i 2008. Vi har startet konstruksjonsbehandlingsprosessene igjen. Det er vi som har lagt frem handlingsplanen for utbygging av kraftnett, der vi går bort fra førstemann til mølla, og nå går over til at vi skal prioritere modne prosjekter. Det satses på sol, det har aldri vært satset mer på energieffektivisering, og vi jobber tett sammen med EU og Tyskland om energipolitikken for å få nyttegjort oss av alle disse tingene her. Så i stedet for å stå opp på morgenen og bare snakke ned i Norge og si at alt går ned om hjem når det aldri har vært investert mer i grønne industri, så synes jeg heller vi skal invitere bedriftene og næringslivet på å tegne et positivt budskap. Hva kan vi få til sammen? Og jeg gjenter invitasjonen hvis det er andre virkemidler, andre tiltak, nye grep vi kan gjøre sammen for å få enda høyere tempo, så kom med det, for denne regjeringen har tenkt til at Norge skal nå klimaforpliktelsene innen 2030, og da haster det å holde tempo oppe. Kort, Melby. Først må jeg få lov å kommentere en ting. Det er jo ikke sånn at oljeskattepakka er det som redder gasskrisa i Europa akkurat nå. Oljeskattepakka har bidratt til et rekordet antall pudder, at det letes og skal finnes olje som vi skal pumpe opp om 10-20 år. Forhåpentligvis har Europa greid å finne seg andre energikilder. Det sier de også selv at de har tenkt, og de øker produksjonen av fornybar kraft mye høyere tempo enn det Norge greier. I Nederland har for eksempel solenergi gått fra å være 0 til 15 prosent av innsatsen deres i kraftmarkedet på en 5-6-7 år. Vi er ikke i nærheten av de tallene. Og så er jo også utfordringen, altså Høyre og Arbeiderpartiet kan godt bruke denne debatten på å skylle på hvem som har gjort for lite før, men jeg tror vi skal snakke mest om hva vi kan gjøre fremover. Og problemet da, Jan Kristian, er at selv om det er veldig bra at det bygges ut havvind på Sørlige Nordsjø 2. Så vet alle som sitter i denne rommet at den utbyggingen kunne ha vært dobbelt så stor, og den kunne ha vært mye billigere for staten hvis vi bare hadde sagt ja til hybridkabler. Så hvis det er bare det å holde Senterpartiet i regjering som forhindrer at vi greier å finne mer energi i Norge, så synes jeg vi skal tenke litt annerledes. Jeg hører at vi skulle ha... Jeg har fått 15 sekunder på det. Jeg hører at vi... 15 sekunder på det. Det må bli 10 sekunder, vet dere. Vi kommer til å bygge hybride kabler, og vi kommer til å bygge radialer til utladet når vi skal doble norsk kraftproduksjon. Men nå trenger vi all den kraften vi kan få hjem til Norge. Og jeg synes sjefen i norsk industri, Ståle Kyllingstad, sier det veldig godt. Det er uansvarlig av høyre og venstre å ikke være med på å legge rammebetingelsene for utbygging av havvind. Det er cirka det samme som når vi sto på startstrekken og olje- og gasseventyr og sier vi vil ikke være med, vi vil ikke si hva vi mener om dette, vi har ikke lyst til å være med å lage brede forlik for at næringen skal ha forutsigbarhet. Jeg er veldig glad for at et flertall på Stortinget nå er med, sånn at vi kommer i gang med denne utbyggingen. Og du må gjerne tro, Nikolai, at dette skjer i 2035, men vi er helt klare på at vi skal være i produksjon på de første feltene til havs i 2030, og det kommer vi til å få til. Men det må jeg få lov å svare på, for da er det litt underlig at din regjering fremmer en proposisjon til Stortinget hvor det tar ti år å utvikle prosjektet. Og da så sier du både du sier det nå, Åsland sa det i Stortinget, da måtte han rygge litt grann, for det var åpenbart at i Stortinget kan du ikke si hva som helst, og her kan du gjøre det. Det tar altså ti år, det er din regjering som har lagt frem den prosessen. I tillegg så på vindkraft på land, det er jo ikke jeg som sier at det ikke blir vindkraft på land, jeg håper det blir masse vindkraft på land, jeg. Det er finansdepartementet som sier at det ikke blir det, og det skjønner jeg jo med det rotet dere har stelt i stand med grunnrenteskatt. Så det er på en måte, det du sier og det du gjør må henge sammen, Jan Kristian, og det gjør det ikke. Heldigvis for dere så skal dere få lov til å fortsette denne diskusjonen etterpå også. Men vi har altså fått inn litt spørsmål. Hvordan kan vi hindre at oljenæringen fortsetter å stikke av med de beste hodene ved å utkonkurrere på lønn? Guri Melby. Alt det her handler om rammevilkår. Hvis vi greier å gi stabile rammevilkår for fornybarnæringen, ikke drive og kaste inn nye skatteendringer på kort sikt uten at noen har blitt hørt i forkant, men la næringen også få si sitt, la næringen få lov til å være med og si hva som skal til for at vi får de utbyggingene vi trenger, i stedet for å bruke alle subsidiene på oljenæringen. Det er det enkleste og det mest effektive vi som politikere kan gjøre. Da lar vi markedet virke, markedet virke til det beste for klimaet. Astrup. Ikke komme med noe angrep på Vestrenda. Nei, nei, altså... Bare svare på spørsmålet. I statskraft så har de vel skjønt at det er bonusordninger som skal til for å holde på de aller beste. Men fra spøk til alvor, det er jo ikke et spørsmål. Enten satser vi på fornybar, eller så utvikler vi sokkelen. Disse to tingene henger veldig tett sammen. Og den kompetansen vi har opparbeidet gjennom 50 år på norsk sokkel, den er ekstremt verdifull i det vi nå skal gjøre i videreutviklingen av aktivitet på sokkelen, både innenfor havvind og CCS og blått hydrogen. Så dette er ikke en enten eller, det er et både og. Og aktivitetsbakken den løper ut i 2026. Etter det så er det ledig kapasitet på norske verft, og da trenger vi å fylle den opp med aktivitet. Og vi kunne fått enda mer aktivitet hvis vi hadde hatt en annen regjering. 
<laughs> det er jo mantra ditt om dagen da, Bare å si at det alt hadde vært litt bedre uten Men nå skulle du svare på det spørsmålet du fikk på det. Ja, det er ikke riktig jeg, jeg, skal... jeg har vært tydelig på hva vi ønsker Vi har vært veldig tydelige med hva vi ønsker med Sørlige Norge 2 Tredoblet produksjon av hva du nå legger opp til Vi vil ha det raskere ved å slå sammen steg i konsesjonsprosessen Og vi bygger på hybridkabel det altså om... Slik Arbeiderpartiet jo også er for Som dere vedtok på ja. deres landsmøte Som vil øke strømprisen hjemme Som vil sende kraft ut Når vi tår trenger den til eget industri Det er ingen land som har bygget ut havvind med hybride kabler enda Vi kommer dit Men nå må vi i gang med produksjon før 2030 Med dine planer var vi langt ut på 2030-tallet Vi skal være produksjon 2030 Derfor har vi begynt før Og vi skal bygge ut 1500 av de flytende 60 turbinene Det kommer til å bli dødsbra og så får du vente og se, og så får, får du fortsette å, å stå opp på morgenen tidspunkt. og være så negativ. Men jeg velger å være positiv på vegne av industrien og kraftbransjen, for dette skal vi få til. Så hva gjør vi med olje? Jo, vi må skape etterspørsel etter de nye grønne verdikjedene. Og hva tror dere for signal det er til unge mennesker når vi nå forteller at vi skal bygge ut 30 gigawatt med flytende havvind? Vi kommer til å se det på rekrutteringen til ingeniør, til fagarbeiderne. Vi ser allerede nå kapital begynner å vise i den retningen. Det vi gjør nå på hydrogenprosjekter, vi har risikoavlastet 20 milliarder bare på halvannet år innenfor batterier, innenfor hydrogen, karbonfangstlagring. Alt dette vil bidra til å gjøre de nye næringene mer lønnsomt, og da vil det gradvis omstille norsk økonomi, gi oss flere bein å stå på, og ja, vi skal nå klimamålene våre. Vi skal gjøre alt av alt, det sa din statsminister i dag tidlig også. Ja, det Tusen hjertelig takk, Jan Kristian Vestre, næringsminister Guri Melby fra Venstre og Nikolai Astrup. Takk. Da, da blir det en 20 minutters pause, så kan dere fortsette å diskutere, eller strekke litt på bena, og så ses vi. What's wrong with the world, mama? People living like they ain't got no mamas I think the whole world is addicted to the drama Only attracted to things that bring a trauma Overseas, yeah, we try to stop terrorism But we still got terrorists here living In the USA, the big CIA Bloods, the creeps, and the KKK. People killing, people die. Children hurt, hear them crying. Can you practice what you preach? Or would you turn the other cheek? Father, 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 help us. Send some guidance from above. People got me, got me questioning Where is the love? It just ain't the same, old ways have changed New days are strange, just the world insane If love and peace are so strong Why are there pieces of love that don't belong? People killing, people dying Children hurt, hear them crying Can you practice what you preach? Or would you turn the other cheek? Father, 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 help us Send some guidance from above Cause people got me, got me questioning where is the love? Where is the love? Where is the love? Where is the love? The love? The Tusen takk til Oda Dahl, også kjent fra The Voice, som nå passende nok spilte Where is the Love? 
av Black Eyed Peas. Og til neste år så kommer hun også ut med egne låter. Folk opplever høyere bensinpris, inflasjon, generelt svært økte levekostnader. Og verre skal det bli, sier mange. Norge trenger også mer kraft og effekt, som vi har hørt gjennom dagen. Kraftutbygginger har blitt møtt med stor motstand både lokalt og nasjonalt, og vi har sett at det vekker enorme følelser. Er det mulig å redusere konflikter ved utbygging av mer kraft og nett? Og hva skal i så fall til for å øke den lokale aksepten? Det er noen av spørsmålene som vårt neste panel skal hjelpe oss å kanskje finne noen svar på. Vi har med oss Sigurd Rafaelsen. Han er ordfører i Lebesby. De har både vann og vindkraft i kommunen, og han har stått i den lokale motstanden. Velkommen. Vi skal få opp Sverre Gotås. Han har de siste årene ledet Herøya Industripark, og også vært medlem i Energikommisjonen. Tidligere også erfaring fra Statkraft. Karoline Andaur er leder av WWF og har jobbet med klima- og miljøspørsmål i WWF i over 15 år. Og Birgitte Ringstad Vartal er konserndirektør i Statkraft med ansvar for Norden. Jeg tenkte å begynne med deg, Sigurd. I 1973 så ble Lebesby en vannkraftkommune. I 2006 så ble det også en vindkraftkommune. Og nå fremover så er det planlagt flere vindkraftprosjekter i kommunen. Du har jo stått midt i dilemmaene knyttet til kraftbygging lokalt. Hva slags erfaringer har du gjort deg? Nei, min erfaring er vel egentlig det at at du kommer ingen vei uten å ha kommunene med på laget. Så i forhold til den grunnrenteskattedebatten som var i forrige runde her, så er det viktig at det kan være en løsning på å få den lokale aksepten. Det at kommunene sitter igjen med mer, og at den innretningen der blir god, og så tilgodeser det i vertskapskommunene. Men så er det jo det her med åpenhet og gode prosesser som er viktig for oss som kommune. At vi vet hva som kommer, vi vet hva vi sitter igjen med, og... Vi er jo en stolt fornybar kommune med statkraft, både med vind og vann. Og for oss så er det også å gjøre noe for å stoppe klimaendringene veldig viktig, som lever av naturen. Vi lever av fisken i havet, som vi ikke vil skal gå lenger nordover. Regn som beit hos oss skal kunne gå fritt over elva, og at isen må faktisk fryse. Sånn at vi har de største insentivene til å gjøre noe med klimaendringene, men det er viktig at kommunene også blir tilgodesett med de verdiene som skapes. Og vi som lever ved siden av vindmøller, vi kjenner oss ikke forstående igjen i all den motstanden. For vi er også stolte av det å produsere ren fornybar energi. Jeg skal snakke mer om det også etterpå. Karolina Andaur, kraftbransjen løser jo klimautfordringene, men bygger også ned natur. Det er mye mer behov for areal. Hva tenker du om dilemma klima på den ene siden, det langsiktige og natur her og nå? Jeg tenker det er egentlig litt kunstig skapt dilemma, fordi vi må løse både naturkrisen og klimakrisen samtidig. Og hvis en tenker på naturens rolle i møte med klimaendringene, så tar de opp halvparten av de menneskeskapte CO2-utslippene årlig. Og en intakt natur er vårt beste vern mot klimaendringene som kommer i forhold til hvordan vi takler mer ekstremer, for eksempel. Så en må se det i sammenheng, en må integrere det, og en må ikke tenke at her er det nødvendigvis et motsetningsforhold. Men det det betyr er at rammebetingelsene for industrien, den optimale løsningen for selskapene på drift og økonomi, må kanskje endres hvis en skal ta inn over seg både natur, men også for eksempel menneskerettigheter. Sverre Gotås, det er kanskje ikke et syn du deler, sett fra industrien? Jo, det er ikke noe problem å være enig i det. Men det er jo som Karoline sier, det er et dilemma. Og det må vi få løst. Men hun sier at det ikke er en motsetning, nødvendigvis. Det er ingen... 
Og så har jeg ikke lyst til å si at det er en motsetning. Det er en motsetning. Hvis du skal høste fra naturen, så må du på et eller annet vis bruke den. Og hvis høstingen går på fornybar kraft eller bygge industri, så betyr det at du putter konstruksjoner et sted hvor det før var natur. Så det, det vil jo alltid være en, en, en diskussion, et dilemma der. Men det er klart, dette må vi kunne få diskutert og få gjort på en fornuftig måte. Nå har vi to kraftige drivkrefter i verden. Denne klimautfordringen som vi må jobbe med for å holde oss under halvannen grad, det var vi nå har lyst til å prøve på. Og det andre er at vi har vedtatt at vi skal verne om til en tredje prosent av naturen vi har. Det er et dilemma. Ikke det at vi må verne et tredje prosent av naturen vi har, det synes jeg er fint. Ikke det at vi må håndtere klimakrisene, det er helt nødvendig. Men vi må finne måter å gjøre det på som gjør at vi som mennesker og resten av de som er på denne jorda faktisk kan leve her videre. Og så vil det alltid være noen som går mer ut over andre. Hvis det bygges en, en vindturbin på et for en fjelltopp i fosen, så går det ut over noen. Selv om ikke jeg som sitter med industrien i, i, på Herøya ser noe til det. Og før var det litt annerledes. Da bygde man gjerne kraftverk der fjobikken skulle stå, og da var det mye lettere å se koblingen mellom det du bygde og det du skulle bruke en til. Nå blir dette så fjernt at det er vanskelig å få befolkningen med seg på å se at dette er et, det vi bidrar til ved å stille vår natur til rådighet, bidrar til å løse en annen problemstilling. Mm. Birgitte Vartal, som er Norges største utbygger av fornybar, eh, tror du at dere vil få nok aksept eh, til å bygge ut nok kraft? Ja, nå har jo statsministeren og andre her sagt at det skal vi få til. Jeg tror det, men det er krevende. Eh, så tror jeg at den debatten som vi har hatt her inne i dag, og som går en del steder, trenger også å løftes ut slik at alle er med på den at det er tydelig hvilke valg vi tar. For at hvis vi ikke velger å bygge ut kraft, så har det også en konsekvens. Enten gjennom at vi må importere kraft, eller at vi ikke når klimamåla som eksempel. Men det er mulig. Vi må gjøre det på en skånsom måte. Jeg tror vi må ta de utbyggingene som påvirker minst. Vi må passe på å forvalte den kraften vi har. Det er utrolig viktig. Og så tror jeg også at vi må være tydeligere på tidsaspektet. Det har jo vært snakket om i dag at vi skal gjøre det raskere og sånn, men i realiteten så er det ganske lange prosesser. Vi må sammen jobbe for å ha grunnige prosesser, men å korte ned tida. Hilde Tonne sa at 2030 i dag, jeg vil nesten si at det er i går i forhold til å bygge ut ny kraft. Og det er nødt, det, den bevisstheten er vi nødt til å ta med oss. Karolina Andau. Ja, vi i WWF ga ut vår første rapport om potensialet på havvind i Nordsjøen i 2010. Vi ga ut en rapport i 2015 som var 100 prosent fornybar på naturens premisser. Allerede da så hadde vi jo konkrete tiltak på hvordan du kunne regulere fornybar energi i forhold til å unngå uh, urørt natur, unngå de truer artene, men det er også til havs, uh, men det gikk da på investeringer og kartlegge natur og investering i godt miljøregelverk. Uh, det har han jo ikke gjort. Eh, samtidig fordi han har mer ivret til liksom, tilrettelegge for eh, industriutvikling. Eh, og jeg tror liksom, hvis han skal komme videre nå, så må han jo liksom, ha alle her i salen med på at ja, vi skal investere i subsidier til havvind hvis han vil det, men hvordan kan han investere i naturkartleggingen og gjøre det parallelt? Her finnes det eksempler hvordan han gjør det i utlandet, men her i Norge så har vi hatt en veldig treghet i det, det systemet. Så når vi nå skal skynde oss fort da, på fornybar energi, hvordan kan vi også skynde oss på denne naturkartleggingen og ikke vente at den skal komme i etterkant for å unngå konfliktene, for å unngå de verste utbyggingene? Og der må vi snu helt, spesielt på myndighetene, på politikerne også, at det å investere i naturkartlegging, det å investere i de gode prosjektene, det er ikke en kostnad som skal stoppe prosjekter. En naturkartlegging, Sverre Gotos, hva tenker du? Jo, jeg synes det er for det første nødvendig, og det er noe man skal gjøre. Og så sitter vi nå med en voldsom utbyggingspotensial, og i hvert fall på politisk sett lyst til og vilje til å bygge ut uh, i havet, og da er det en fantastisk mulighet til å i hvert fall starte riktig der. Så havet er jo også i bruk av mange, ikke bare oss som frakter oss selv opp på havet og bruker, legger kabler og mye rart der under, men det er noen som er der, og den kartleggingen er såpass, etter min mening, så viktig og så sentral for å få gjennom at det er noe staten burde ta umiddelbart og begynne på de områdene de nå har lagt ut og si at dette har vi en overordnet plan for, dette har vi ansvaret for å få gjort så er i hvert fall sikker på at det blir gjort, og blir gjort på en enhetlig måte. Og så er det noe så enkelt at skal du ha 
mye energi fort, så må vi nok begynne å bruke, fortsette å bruke landjorda også, og da er det vind på land, som er den definitivt raskeste, hvis vi ser bort fra sol, som vi kan få til, men ja, det er litt mindre potensiale på, men vind på land er noe raskeste vi kan få gjort, og det er der jeg ser for meg at de store konfliktene vil komme om, og kommer det å komme, og som det er politisk vilje til å ta de prosessene som skal til for å få folk til å forstå hva det egentlig holder på med. En ting er at du bygger et vindkraftverk i Lebesby, da, og så kommer det en elektron eller to ned til Herja. Det er vanskelig å få koblet de to sammen. Men det viktigste er jo, som Karoline også sier, hva er alternativ? Og som Gita sier, hva er alternativ hvis vi ikke får denne kraften til gjengelig? Vi skal... Energikommisjonen fikk med seg to kraftige rammebetingelser inn. Vi skal nå klimamålene ned 55 prosent innen 2030, og vi skal øke landeksporten med 50 prosent. Det eneste stedet vi kan kutte 55 prosent CO2 er i dagens verden. Du kutter ikke et gram CO2 og bygger en ny fabrikk, du kutter og gjør noe med det du har. Så mesteparten av dette må vi ta det allerede her. Det betyr at norsk industri, for å snakke deres sak, må dekarboniseres. Og til det trenger de massive mengder grønn energi. Veien til det grønne skiftet er, det er brolagt med elektrisitet. Og det må vi få frem. Alternativet er at vi på grunn av CO2-toll og andre avgifter, sannsynligvis da vil få færre og færre industrialarbeidsplasser i Norge, som ikke nødvendigvis er en katastrofe, men da må vi ta den diskusjonen. Så er det umulig å stå her og snakke om lokal aksept uten å komme innom Fosen-saken. Birgitte, hvordan... Hvordan opplever dere situasjonen på Fosen, og hva vil du si, hva slags implikasjoner har den saken hatt for utbygging av mer fornybar kraft i Norge? Først og fremst må jeg si at det er en krevende situasjon som vi tar på alvor, og den er jo ikke minst krevende for regndriften som har stått i det her så lenge. Nå er vi i et spor med megling som vi virkelig håper skal føre frem, og så gjør vi vårt for det, men det er mange parter med i den meglingen. Og så vil jo selvfølgelig det her ha konsekvenser på sikt, og jeg har vel noen refleksjoner om det også, men jeg har lyst til å fokusere på meglingen nå, og så får vi i hvert fall fra vårt ståsted ta den debatten når vi forhåpentligvis har kommet et steg videre der. Sigurd Raffelsen. Ja, nei, jeg tror jo at det som er viktig er at kommunene blir involvert først. Det er den første som går til hvis du ønsker å bygge ut vind i en kommune. Og hvis det er en kommune som har reindrift, så skal reindriftet også involveres med en gang. Og det er viktig å ha åpenhet og dialog om prosessen for å skape de beste løsningene. Kommunene har aldri vært de som har stoppet vindkraftutbygging. Kommunene er planmyndighet. Nå også har vi fått endring i planbyggingsloven som gir oss som kommuner mer rett i det. Det er bra. Men det er viktig å da ta kommunene med som en likeverdig part i prosessen, så at man er med på alle nivå for hensyn til at de verdiene som kommunen setter høyt, og vi har også ansvaret for å ivareta alle andre brukere og rettighetshavere i våre sarealer. Så det og involvering er bra, og så tror jeg at kommunene aldri har vært stopper, men når man kom med nasjonal ramme, så var det en stopp for vindkraftbygging, for da fikk alle trodde man ble påtrengt vindkraft der man ikke ville ha det. Og det var det også forrige regjering som gjorde, og det var det som også var med å bygge opp motstand. Men nå gjør man grep hvor man gir kommunene tilbake mer makt, man også tilgodeser kommunene mer, og det tror jeg er veien å gå for at vi skal få bygd ut mer fornybar energi. Gotos, du var inne litt på disse dilemmaene, og det ser ut som at noe av vindkraftmotstanden kan ha gått noe ned. Ja, men så er det, hvis det er, altså de sterkeste stemmene er jo i lokalmiljøet, ikke sant? Det er greit så lenge det er langt unna, men når det er liksom på nabotomten, så er det ikke så, da er man ikke så opptatt av det. Ja, det er jo, de færreste vil jo ha en vindturbin i haven, så det er noe sånn, eller sikkert meg og mange andre det. Og derfor må det, må det for det første må da kommunene få de verktøy de trenger for å ta de slagene som faktisk vil stå, det er der det må stå. Kommunen har bokta begge enden, heldigvis. Det finnes ikke et kraftverk på land som ikke blir bygd i en kommune, så de må ha de verktøyene som skal til. Pengene er sikkert et av de. Men jeg tror også en del av denne prosessen som i hvert fall politiske myndigheter på alle nivåer må bruke tid på, er jo også å forklare alternativene. 
For nu har vi liksom en ting, og det vi skal nå et klimamål som for de aller fleste er ganske diffust. Selv om det er varmt i Oslo i dag og blir varmere om noen to-tre dager, så har det alltid vært varmt av og til. Det kan hende vi må få det ned på bakken og si at for AS Norge som nation så er dette et valg om hvordan vi vil dra nasjonen vår fremover, hva vi skal bygge vår velferd på, hvor vi skal få våre inntekter hen, det er det det går på. En eller annen gang kommer denne oljevirksomheten til å trappe ned, og vi skal ikke bruke det som en trussel, men det er bare et rent fakta, da skal vi som deles av inntekter, og for eksempel da industrien som jeg selvfølgelig brenner for, den er da en viktig del å dra dette videre, og hvis vi ikke bidrar til at industrien kan dra seg selv inn etter den grunne skiftet vi snakker om, så bidrar vi til å underminere en av våre muligheter til å opprettholde velstanden vår. Og det er det diskusjonen til syvende og sist går på. Hvordan Norge vil vi leve i om 15-20 år? Hvor skal vi hente pengene våre? Hvor skal jobbene være? Mindre velstand, Karoline. Nei, men det er ikke nødvendigvis ikke tilfellet. Ikke sant? I dag så lever vi jo i stort sett av oljefondet og rente oss rente der. Og det er viktig med å påfylle inn der og skape, som du sier, verdiskapende jobber. Liksom at ikke alle jobber i det offentlige. Vi skal ha industrijobber, og så kan vi velge hvor vi vil putte de. Så det betyr ikke mindre velferd. Og knyttet til det så vil jeg si at vi har en naturkrise, vi har en klimakrise, men vi snakker veldig lite om den tredje krisen. Er du et annet sted i verden nå, så snakker du om en rettferdighetskrise. Fordi fordelingen av goder er skjevt, en opplever dyrtid veldig forskjellig, og en ser blant unge nå også en tillitskrise eller en sosial krise. Og det ser vi i ubefolkningsgrupper over hele verden, der en har en tillitskrise, en har en sosial krise på grunn av at storsamfunnet har behandlet. Det er en del av den aksepten en nå skal ha, enten om en driver med fornybar industriutbygging eller annen type virksomhet. Og det er den virkeligheten vi ikke helt kom til her i Norge, fordi, for å være helt ærlig, så har vi ikke kjent på alle krisene her i Norge som vi har andre steder, fordi vi har tatt vare på naturressursene på en veldig klok måte. Og det er jo det vi skal fortsette fremover, og når vi da skal inn i en ny industriære som ble pekt på av statsministeren, så må vi ta kloke valg, og det betyr at det kan ikke gjøre alt som før. Birgitte, hva har man lært av tidligere konflikter, og hva vil, tenker du at bransjen bør gjøre annerledes i fremtiden for å få bredere lokal aksept? Det har jo vært nevnt eksempel der turbinene plutselig er dobbelt så høye som det som var prosjektert. Jeg tror ikke nødvendigvis at det lar seg gjøre lenger, men det å være til stede lokalt, synliggjøre for befolkningen, hvordan vil det prosjektet se ut, være i dialog, tror jeg er veldig viktig for å skape en trygghet. Så er det selvfølgelig viktig at det ligger igjen noe lokalt, og det er vi også veldig for. Vi er bare opptatt av at det er konsistent på tvers, og ikke noe man diskuterer fra prosjekt til prosjekt. Og så tror jeg, for å ta et annet eksempel relatert til Fosen, Åfjord kommune satt seg som et mål at 25 prosent av investeringen skulle ligge igjen lokalt. Og det å også da i byggeperioden bruke lokale bedrifter, lokale entreprenører, slik at man ser at det er aktivitet lokalt, tror jeg er et viktig element. Og maskinparken til Syltern har aldri vært så ny som etter at fosen ble bygd ut, det kan jeg i hvert fall si. Tusen takk. Tiden løper fra oss. Karolina Andaur, Sverre Gotås, Birgitte Bartal og Sigur Afagelsen. Takk skal dere ha. Da vi på torsdag ble klar over at det var annonsert en demonstrasjon, så diskuterte vi det og syntes det hadde vært hyggelig å invitere inn representanter for de viktige stemmene. Så vi har invitert, og dere skal ha skryt for at dere er spårt i på kort varsel og stille opp, så har vi invitert styreleder Larissa Avelar i Latinamerika-gruppene, og Elle Ravna Nekkele-Gjervi fra NSR Norat for å holde to korte, tre minutter lange presentasjoner. Så vil Kristian etterpå kommentere kort. Så da skal dere få en mikrofon, og så gi jeg ordet til dere. Den styrelsen er bare, jeg tror den skal gå rett på. Hei. Ja. 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 Tusen takk. Hva er en elv verdt? For åtte år siden har Statkraft kjøpt seg en konflikt som heter Los Lagos-prosjekt i Pilmeik-elven 
Chile. Området är er gem till med pochefolke och till ett mångfald av planter och dyra arter. Dessa arter blev erklärt av det chilenska miljövårdsdepartementet som utrydningstruade. Där blev det också uppdagat arkeologiska fynd från för kolonitiden. Pilmaiken visar att en elv kan ge ett gem kan vara en kulturell och historisk arv. Det är dessa rikedomar i stadskraft sätter i fara med sitt projekt på Los Lagos. Så vad är en elv värt egentligen? För stadskraft är elven värt 400 odokumenterade konsultationer med urfolksgrupper. Vi lag har ett spurt med information om konsultationerna men har inte fått det. I Sattkraft hävdar att det är kun två lokala grupper som är mot projektet. Men ifølge en nylig utgivet rapport av The Energy Justice Clinic är det flera än 50 grupper som är mot projektet. Vi tränger mer transparens runt konsultationsprocessen. Men att det finns grupper som inte är mot projektet betyder inte att de stöter projektet. Kanske de inte orkar att fortsätta kampen mot den europeiska kolonialistiska makt. Urfolk är slitna och desperata efter att hundra med undertryckelse. Det är inte alla som gider att fortsätta kampen. För Mapuchen är elven värt deras hem, deras kultur, deras mänsklighet. För Pilmaiken har en central roll i Mapuchen kultur. Och kultur är ett av träckarna som ger oss mänsklighet. Avisar vi Mapuchen kultur? Avisar vi delar av mänskligheten till Mapuchen? Vi latinamerikagrupperna är upptatt av att respektera och stödja lokal befolkning i kampen med att bryta kolonialistiska mönster. Avkarbonisering är ett reellt behov, men i Los Lagos tillfälle kan projektet föra till ödeläggelse som är större än nytten. Det gröna skiftet i satskraft i önskar utföra i Chile går på bekostning av utredelse av planter och dyra liv och på bekostning av vår folks rättighet till land och till att utöva sin kultur. Där vi ser att stadskraft knyter sig till utredelse av planter och dyr och till kulturmord. Så stor är risken för att stadskraft och Norge som nation tappar omdöme med det gröna skiftet. Önskar stadskraft och orientera kolonialistiska historien i Latinamerika? Eller önskar de att vara pionjärer med en verklig grön lösning som fungerar för alla? Valget är deras. Det är ingen skam oss nu, säg. Vi ger oss inte. Tusen tack. Tusen tack. På vägna av organisationen Anna Sernorat och Natur och ungdom och mina urfolkssösken som känner statskraft sin nådelösa projekt på kroppen så är er jag här i protest. Jag är er också här för att påminna doker om ansvaret som ligger i dokers händer. För någon dagar sedan så kom Sandhets- och försoningskommissionen med en knallhård dom över statens förnorskningspolitik. En assimileringspolitik fört av staten Norge i över hundra år med mål om att fjärna samisk kultur och språk. Kommissionsrapport konkluderade med att förnorskningen framdeles pågår. Som vår syster Petra Leidy sa då det hade gått 600 dagar med, med mänskrättighetsbrott på fosen. Samiska områder och samiska kropper är er oadskilleliga. När dokker målar målar upp landan våres så är er det skallan våres dokker målar. När dokker bygger vindmöller på våra helliga fjäll så är er det näglan av fingrarna våra stöker rösker ut. Och när dokker dämmer upp våra helliga elver, så är er det blååran dokkes blååran våra som dokker tapper för blå. Och det är er bara en förlängelse av assimileringspolitiken mot samer i Norge. Så inte fortell mig att dokker löser klimakrisen ved att bygga bygga gigantanlägg i sårbar natur. Ikke fortell mig att dokker räddar världen vi att tvinga oss ut av vår hem. Ikke fortell mig att dokker vet bäst. För dokkers grönvaska kapital ödelägger och dräper den gröna naturen. 
Så lösningarna på mänsklighetsbrott i Norge är er inte att flytta utlands för att driva landran på andres urfolks territorier. Vi upplever härsketekniker från män klädd i dress som ställer oss upp mot våra vänner i Mapuche folket. Vi accepterar inte det. Vi accepterar inte att bli sedd på som fredliga och snille mens våra eh, sösken blir sedd på som aggressiva och våldliga. De sista genlevande och friska ökosystemen i världen finns i områder som är er förvalta av urfolk. I stedet för att lytte till den här unika traditionskunskapen som finns överför dokker våra rättigheter. Ska vi lösa klimakrisen sammen, så må vi också bli hört. Igen och igen hör vi att vi också må offra något. Till det så säger jag: Känn den norska historien med förnorskning och assimilering. Vi har allerede offra i hundrevis av år. Vit att vi inte har mer att offra. Så kraven våres till statkraft, det är er en respekter fosendommen. Riv ner vindturbinen och tillbakaför landet till Fosenjärke. 2. Träck er ut av Mapuche territorie, stans byggingen av vattenkraftverk i Pilmaiken och tillbakaför landet. 3. Ikke la framtida investeringar gå på bekostning av naturmangfold, lokalbefolkning och mänskligheter. Det finns både dålig och god handlekraft. Det är er god handlekraft i att stå upp för urfolksrättigheter och beskytte naturen. Så bruk handlekraften till något gott. För vi söker fortsätter i den riktningen med gammeldags kolonisering, gömt bak en ny typ av maske, så kommer framtiden till att känna docker som dem som också sviktar oss. Kito, tack. Tusen tack. Christian, for å kommentere, vi er opptatt av å bygge tillit i statskraft. Skal vi bygge tillit, så er vi helt avhengig av å lytte og stille oss åpne for motargumenter. Og tusen takk for at dere to bidrar til det. Og takk for mig også for at dere stiller opp her. Dette er jo ikke lett. Løse klima, klimakrisen... Eh og god skjønnsutøvelse av å være god og være dårlig handlekraft. I Statskraft så sørger vi jo for at alt det vi gjør av utbygginger, det er i tråd med regionale lover og regler. Det vi snakker om her, det er hvordan kan vi på basis av det sørge for at de projekten som vi er inne i, blir gjort på en ansvarlig måte og i dialog med de samfunnene der folk bor, inkludert der urfolk bor. Ut rydningstrute arter, transparens rundt konsesjonsprosessene eh, og dialog. Vi har et stort ansvar, vi er ikke bare i statkraft, men... Eh, stort sett alle som er her, for det vi driver med, og sørge for at vi gjør det på en ansvarlig måte. I Norge så har vi en tung historie i forhold til hvordan samer har blitt behandlet bakover i tid. Og den historien den må vi ha med oss inn i det, vi, det ansvar vi forvalter i dag. Så uh, det er jo sånn at uh, det er en, en lang grønnsone, for å si det sånn, fra det som er god, uh, ansvarlig, fornuftig utbygging av fornybar energi, tilrettelagt for, uh, for de som skal bo der, og over i en uansvarlig eh, grønnvaskings eh, oppførsel. Og det jeg kan love det er at i statskraft så skal vi gjøre vårt ytterste for å 
treffe den balansen riktig. Det er vanskelig å nå frem til prosjekter der alle er enige, men vi kommer til å legge stor vekt på å prøve å finne gode løsninger. Jeg skal ikke prøve her å si nøyaktig hva det er, men begge innleggene dere hadde gjorde gjorde stort inntrykk på meg, så det betyr noe for måten jeg kommer til å resonere på fremover. Takk skal dere ha. Vi vil nå fokusere på den siste sesjonen av denne konferansen. Vi skal skifte fokus mot offshore vind. Det er sagt at offshore vind har vært nevnt i virkelig alle sesjonen så far i dag. Men er vi til å dekarbonisere det energisystemet, bli mer independent av olje og gass? Offshore vind vil mest sannsynlig spille en signifikant rolle, både i Norge, Europa og globalt, i det energisystemet. There are many questions, not many uh, fixed answers. Um, just the co past couple of weeks in Norway, we have seen the postponement of Trollvin. We have seen delays in uh, large wind turbines uh, delivered. Uh, we have, as we saw uh, half an hour ago, a uh, heated political debate over uh, what uh, structures we should put in place for the different auctions rounds. Is Norway coming too late to the table? Um, we've just heard uh, uh, the representatives on the conflicts on onshore. We will see the same kind of sustainability issues and, and conflicts uh, also offshore. Many questions, hopefully a couple of answers. To do this, we have invited three people to do presentations, and that will be followed by a, a short panel. And to kick it all off, I couldn't find uh, any or think of anyone better than uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Tim. I just forgot your name. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Shame on you, Klaus. Timothy Pick. Uh, Timothy Pick, welcome to stage, Tim. You just completed your assignment as uh, offshore wind champion in the UK, delivered a report who we all should uh, read, mm -hmm. uh, but you will give us the highlights uh, advising governments, uh, the industry and other stakeholders in how not only UK built a leading offshore industry, but how you will keep that position. And of course, as Norwegians, we are very keen to learn. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, and look, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I was reflecting on this earlier. I've spent 27 years in the oil and gas industry as a pro an energy projects lawyer. I never came to Norway. Um, I've spent one year as uh, the UK offshore wind champion. In fact, a, a month or two as the ex-UK offshore wind champion. I've been to Norway twice in the last three weeks. So that, <laughs> that must say something. Look, people recognize the UK has had a successful um, period in offshore wind. It's gone from being a pretty niche activity to being absolutely core to our energy system in a period of 20 years. Um, and by the way, I'm not sure the mem members of the public in the UK really know that. Um, we have the largest fleet outside China. You've heard the stats. We have the first, second, third, fourth, fifth largest wind farms in the world, etc. And our politicians love to, um, love to boast about those. What's really exciting is the plan forward. Um, we, as a, as a policy objective, the UK would like to have a decarbonized power system, a bit like Norway's, I guess, by 2035. And when you look at modeling work done by our climate change committee of what that system would look like, offshore wind is an absolute backbone component of that system. Um, so lots of exciting stuff to come. Um, I won't get into the fact that the UK government doesn't actually have a plan to deliver that system. <laughs> that's, a, that's another story. Um, this is our current pipeline, and if I'd known Meredith was here, I would have used Bloomberg modeling, but this is Renewable UK modeling. We, um, we currently have about just under 14 gigawatts of operational capacity in the UK. We are on track to hit about 40 gigawatts by the end of this decade. Bloomberg's model is pretty similar to this Renewable UK one and comes up with a similar number. Not surprising, we're only for seven years away, and these are large infrastructure projects, and effectively, we're in the hands of a handful of projects to get to that result. 
The other good news for us in the UK is we've deployed all this offshore wind as costs have come down. So you've seen the graph presented by Kettle from ACA um, showing this 70% decline in strike price. What I'm showing here is that decline mapped against turbine size. We need to remember that you know, there are some people in the UK who believe auctions deliver um, outcomes in terms of cost. It's engineers who deliver outcomes in terms of cost. Um, <laughs> And you can see that as that cost curve has come down, lo and behold, the turbine size has gone up. Um, some would say the cost curve, and I think I would agree, the cost curve has come down a bit too far now, and we need to have a little bit of a reset into a more sustainable price going forward, supply chains not making money, et cetera. That's a PR challenge for government in the UK. There's been a constant narrative about renewables always get cheaper. Um, and of course, just to flag, these numbers are all for fixed bottom offshore wind. We hope floating offshore wind will follow a similar trajectory. I guess we will end up mapping strike prices against serial production metrics or something like that, but we should all recognize there is a long way to go on floating offshore wind. We saw the ACA 11 units in two years. You know, we need to be getting to one a week from multiple ports in the UK to meet our ambitions. Sorry, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say... I was about to leave now because clearly the UK has, has created the perfect system and just copy us and everything will be fine. <laughs> Not true. Um, like, in, like a lot of countries around the world, our development cycle for offshore wind has been extending. So we've gone over this period on this chart from the early 2000s. The typical time to get from leasing of the seabed to an FID decision has increased from roughly five to roughly 10 years, and many cases above 10 years. It's interesting that the projects under construction today were leased in the Gordon Brown government. Now, in UK terms, that's like 27 governments ago. Um, <laughs> in, uh, in just the 10 months I was working, I had three bosses. Um, and the other interesting thing, and this goes to some, uh, Judith Scon, I think, but um, it goes to the points Judith was making. Many in the UK would say we missed out on some of the supply chain and jobs opportunity coming out of this industry. Um, so we've had a laser focus on big deployment, cheapest cost. That is brilliant for consumers. That's absolutely perfect for me paying my bill. Um, not great if you want to develop a supply chain business, if you want jobs in this industry. And there's a really interesting challenge for all of us in get that path between um, global, open global markets, cost reduction for the benefit of consumers versus energy security, supply chain growth, and just transition. There's a really interesting path to follow there. And nobody's got that right yet. So um, I was appointed last May, um, three prime ministers ago, as I said. Um, to be the UK's first offshore wind champion. So this, these champion roles, they used to be called czars, but that's politically incorrect these days. Um, but it was obviously a huge privilege to spend 10 months just wandering around the industry, wandering around government, trying to get to grips with it, um, co-chairing a task force, um, looking at acceleration, and coming up with some independent recommendations. Please go and have a look at the report. I'm not just saying it because I wrote it. I think it's quite relevant to Norway. Um, you've got a lot of the same challenges, but you're earlier in the game, so you can fix them earlier. I'm going to rapidly go through some key themes. Auction design, absolutely key. Loads of different models all over Europe, load dif achieving different objectives, offering different risk packages to developers. In the UK, we run a dual auction process, so we auction the seabed. We allow people to go through the planning process, get their grid connection, and then we auction the CFD at the end. A um, few, few interesting aspects to that. Clearly, if you do an upward-only auction or, I guess, a race to the top at the start of your development and a race to the bottom at the end, you're crushing the sort of supply chain margin in the middle. Um, the other thing with our auction, our CFD auction comes at the very end of development, so just when you want to start construction. So if you're a supply chain business who needs to invest to be able to deliver stuff against that opportunity, you're getting your contract very late in the day, probably too late to make that investment. That's critical for ports in particular. So lots of things to think about in auction design. In the UK, Scotland has a slightly different system. They've moved to more non-price factors in the seabed lease auction. That's created a lot of discussion in the UK. I think in the Celtic Sea leasing round coming up in England and Wales, you're now going to see some non-price factors in there, at least in terms of supply chain and social development. So 
um, watch this space. There's also debate going on about non-price factors in the CFD, trying to sort of moderate this very aggressive upward and downward price focus. Faster consenting, a need all over Europe. Um, this is not about trashing the environment, by the way. This is about getting the balance right. We, are, we have, in the UK, we have been using consenting systems that were not specifically designed for offshore wind. They're used for everything else as well in terms of major infrastructure. And as we've got more deployment, more crowded seas, um, we've, we're starting to tailor them more specifically to offshore wind, hopefully to speed up the process. But a few other points I would make relevant to Norway. Marine spatial planning is absolutely key to this. Um, avoiding the conflicts with fishermen, with environmental protection, with military, whatever other use of the sea you have, if you get that right up front, it can save you a lot of headache. Um, data, and somebody talked about this earlier, a lot of the friction in our planning system comes from data. People don't know where hab habitats begin and end, where things migrate and back again. If you, if you don't know the baseline, very difficult to understand the impact and therefore the, in, the mitigation you have to put in place. And then finally, and I'm sure this is the same in Norway, it's the same all across Europe, resourcing in the planning bodies, the local authorities, the um, environmental protection agencies, need to be, they need to have the right staff, the right capability, the right digitalization to process these applications quickly. Grid connections, I'm going to skip over this, but Meredith touched on it, everyone's touched on it. We're starting a process of reform in the UK. Um, we are finally updating our electricity regulators remit to match our net zero legally binding target. It's about 15 years too late, but at least it's happening now. We are implementing a new independent system operator separate from National Grid, which will hopefully look at a more holistic planning of, the, um, of both the grid, the gas grid, hopefully hydrogen grid, whatever else we, whatever other networks we need for the energy transition. And we are reforming the queue away from the first mover or the first come first serve to more of a project viability based approach, more to come on that. And I guess critically, going to the Brazil example quoted by Meredith, we also need a lot more north-south transmission capacity, physical capacity. Um, that plan is moving forward. It's been approved economically but the point was made by StatNet, permitting, permitting, permitting. It's going to be a big challenge. And that's before you think about the supply chain consequences of trying to source 7,000 kilometers of HVDC cable. I'll pick that up later. Um, the, this was, the capacity bottlenecks in both ports and supply chain was a huge topic at the Hogesund floating offshore wind days that I attended a few weeks ago. Um, there's loads of bottlenecks in this industry, but let's just think about ports. UK, we recently did a study for our floating wind ambitions. That concluded we need to upgrade 11 ports at a cost of £4 billion. If you look at wind, wind Europe statistics, 45 ports across Europe at a cost of €6 billion. Euros. I went to Ireland recently to do a similar talk. They recently did a study. They have no port in the entire republic that can do offshore wind. Ports are a major bottleneck. Governments need to get on top of this quickly. And that's very different across Europe in terms of the level of privatization, the incentives and disincentives to invest. Um, and then I've got one, one minute, 20 seconds left. What's next? So first of all, we've had some reform of our offshore wind industry council. So our task force has ended. We've gone back to business as usual. My friend Richard is the new chair. Um, and so he'll talk to you shortly. Um, we have Celtic Sea Leasing Round coming up. We're talking about non-price factors, and I guess the live issue at the moment in the UK is CFD Auction Round 5, um, the first of our move to annual auctions. We will, it will be very interesting to see both the bidding strategies adopted in that auction, considering you can bid next year instead, and also the price point that comes out. And then finally, just over the horizon, a few interesting topics that are sort of occupying my brain when I'm sat on flights and stuff. Um, wake effect studies, there's going to be some interesting um, developments later this year when we see the outcome of those. Crowded seas like the North Sea could get quite interesting if you start seeing big wake effect problems across borders. In the UK, we will soon get to decommissioning and repowering decisions for some of the older offshore wind farms. We need a new policy structure for ideally a very quick repowering process, shortcut the planning system, 
you've already got the grid connection, you've got the plant there, just move on. Um, very relevant, obviously, to Norway, this Russian ship that was hovering around wind farms all over Europe over the summer, over the spring. Um, and then finally, we touched on energy islands and, frankly, the need for a lot of cooperation in the Northern Seas to make any of this work. And we're done. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Our next speaker is uh, Kimberly Matisen, uh, CEO of Hub Ocean, which is a foundation, and they aim to collect data and share data and collaborate to save our oceans. And Kimberly, you have a fantastic CV, a background from very different industries, from technology to pharmaceuticals to fast-moving consumer goods but now very much focused on, uh, on how we can use data to make offshore wind and other industries more sustainable. Indeed. Thank you very much, Klaus. And thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, a very important day with very many voices to be heard. We've covered a lot of aspects, particularly some at the end here, which uh, you must be very glad to see on the stage. So I'd like to use my voice in these 10 minutes to deep dig i havet, to go down under the ocean and talk a little bit more about what is this space that we need to pay much more attention to. It is the single biggest resource that we need to hold us as we go into the energy transition, right? It is the place that has been absorbing, the ecosystem that's been absorbing 90% of the excess heat on the planet for us. It's absorbing 30% of all the carbon emissions, and it is also the place where 80% of life exists. And we're about to undergo a nine times build-out. Yes, DNV's report says nine times the build-out is going to happen on the ocean. 83% of that is going to be offshore wind, but the ocean is going to get a very busy space. And we're carrying on as if it's obvious that the ocean will just absorb this pressure. But that's a very poor assumption. If you look under the hood at what's happening, strong indicators, I could talk a long time about what we begin to know. But we humans have fished out, for example, 85% of all the big fish in the ocean in the last 50 years. Can you believe our ingenuity? We have become so good. We have fished out 85% of all the big fish in the ocean, and we stand to lose. 95% or more of all the coral reefs in the ocean within the next 28 years. Is that not sounding serious? We must act against this. We can no longer treat the ocean health as not optional, as a side activity. In fact, we must become just as good at this as we are at engineering these physical feats, these digital feats, right, at helping a supply chain to bring them forward. We must be just as demanding and good at taking care of our ocean. So I'm going to talk a little bit about hub ocean, but then I want to get to use cases, and particularly wind energy, where we can act with data. The genesis of hub ocean, the nonprofit foundation which I lead now, was to fill in a major gap on data. It's to recognize that there are enormous challenges out there around data. There are stranded assets everywhere, pockets of data, which are just lying open, but oh so difficult to make available, to really integrate. And there's lots of closed data that's never seen the light of day. Our genesis is in this poorly mapped space and to turn that around fundamentally. So we're a foundation. That, was, that is supported primarily by Schellinger-Rucker and Acker in terms of philanthropic investment under the auspices of the World Economic Forum, deeply partnered with the United Nations Decade for Ocean Science, which is about filling in these data gaps from a scientific perspective over the next years. And we hold a mandate from the high-level panel, which I hope you know comes out of Norway, in Erna Solberg's government, and is now 17 countries strong, a political um, apparatus to really drive forward ocean health um, and help countries everywhere to map and manage their space. We're building something called the Ocean Data Platform. With this is the mission. We're working at the intersection of science 
and industry and government. And you can't get this job done as, as just think about all the issues that we've brought forth today. You cannot succeed in this mission unless you build down the barriers, the silos, unless you build up the mindset for collaboration and take the data with you. And that is what our platform and our long-term funding has an ambition to deliver. We will need a shift in transparency. We will need all of us to recognize that the way, for example, we've allowed business to operate does not give us the diagnostic tools to take care of our ocean in the way that we must. Yes? And we must change that and be willing to escort in another level of transparency, be it willing or be it forced. Forced transparency, better known as regulations, I would argue, are the best friend of those companies who would like to be considered forward-leaning in today's world and into the future. So the vision is to build the world's data collaboration hub. The mission is to use it, set it into practice in all kinds of important places in order to change the fate of the ocean with that deeper ability to gather insights and data, hold ourselves accountable, draw insights, and do these jobs we need to do through deepening our form of collaboration. These are the goals that the high-level panel and its 250 experts have given to us. It's an incredibly well-researched and documented set of work. I encourage you to read it. it. In short, the goals that we must achieve to make the whole world ecosystem come right, the ocean included, are captured on here. So you see, 40 times more renewable energy right smack there in front of us. That's what we all must achieve. Sustainable food, we need six times more from the ocean, and I just told you we haven't had a great history of that. So what do we need to change? Green transportation, the shipping that runs across these oceans. It's there and many other places, including the finance industry, that we at Hub Ocean and, and all of us collectively are seeking and we must act with this data. So these are the goals we ask ourselves every day. Well, if you can unlock and amass data like never before, how do you set it to work for these goals? We're paid on impact, and getting closer to these goals is what we're trying to achieve. So this is the Ocean Data Platform, but I use it to illustrate this broader effort that I would ask all of us to lean into and engage in, to make our data more transparent across all of these silos and be able to allow it to be an accelerator, which we've so badly said over and over today that we need. The kind of data I'm talking about, the open data of the world, the best databases we have, they're the best um, seabed floor data we have, the best biodiversity database we have, the best human activity databases. They have lots of letters and acronyms. They're wonderful, but they're hugely difficult to access today, and they're highly insufficient for the job that we must all go do. Therefore, we need industry to open up their data. Temperature, salinity, subsea currents, is any of that really hard to let go to the public? Most intelligent conversations that I'm having, when we get down to actually what could be valuable for the scientists and what's useful, most folks are saying, no, we should have never locked that up in the first place. We can bring that out. So it isn't the most difficult, highly competitive, highly sensitive information I'm typically asking for. We can come a long way by scooping up wonderful data sets like I just talked about. There's nowhere else besides, for example, oil and gas and industry that you'll find this wonderful collection of subsea current data, temperature, salinity, taken from the same place for the last 40 years. It doesn't exist anywhere else. It's magic. And you probably haven't known the importance of it if you've been sitting in industry. It's about bringing that data onto a connected environment, not onto the same cloud space, but federating it and connecting it together. And it's about fueling it into the best climate models in the world in science. Governments that need to make marine spatial planning decisions with coexistence needs much faster than eight, 10 years and longer, right? And it's about making smart regulation. And for industry, it's about creating win-wins, pre-competitive arenas where collaboration takes data with it and does jobs for us far beyond what we've actually, the speed at which we've actually been able to accomplish so far. So all of that to heal the ocean and rewire industry. And then I'm into the use cases. The trouble is, we've all been coming from different parts of this triangle. We're building a lot of human assets up at the top, but so far we've not disclosed a lot about those assets. 
Everyone should know that the European and other taxonomies around the world are now, in a space of a short few years, forcing open where your assets are, what revenue you're driving from them, and what the impact they have on the environment is. There is no place to hide in the short future, if you are thinking of hiding there. Now, I'm sure you're all wanting to lean forward into this, but the trouble is we haven't got a good understanding in industry about what's on the bottom of the, the, the pyramid, the scientific data, the life in the ocean, the variables around the ocean. Science-based targets are about lifting that science into industry, and the regulations are about pushing industry and the finance industry lining up around it to act and to be accountable and knowledgeable about the impacts. So the way all of this can come together is very, very interesting. Spatial finance or geospatial finance is something I'd encourage you to learn more about. This is about the industry, the financial industry, and many others structuring the pressures that are coming from a ship on the ocean, the age of the fleet, where it drives, what it carries, how long it hangs out in vulnerable territories, and of course, all the emissions. It's about structuring up behaviors like bilge water dumping, like slowing down so you don't smash into whales, precious whales, just for a small period of time. Structuring that data for the finance industry so that there's an accountability down to ownership of assets is happening at a very rapid pace. So if that's not enough for you to sit up and notice, then I go to, to offshore wind. The thesis must be clear that there are so many ways we can accelerate this. Every action will matter and data will help us. So the kinds of things that are very, very real that we should be leaning hard into are unlocking oil and gas data historically. We just heard we've got to have that baseline. We absolutely can't spend three years waiting to create a baseline and then three years arguing with ourselves that the urgency is too high to get everything built so we cannot create a three-year baseline. That's irresponsible. And join the chorus that's saying, in fact, that's unacceptable. We can do it faster and better, and we must. So unifying our collection of data. Let's not shoot seismic 12 times in the same place in relatively the same period. Let's do it differently and share it with each other. We just heard a call to action around that. Let's get to biodiversity data with the technology that's out there that tells us in the best possible way how we really minimize the impact to nature and how we accelerate the whole thing. And the processes, for example, in the Netherlands, some of the first bids that have done a very nice job of saying, if you want to win this bid, you have to come with very meaningful interventions on the environment. Every country should be doing that, and such efforts will already, in the first territory one in the, in the, in the Netherlands, lead to open sharing, open data platforms. And through that, look there first, we'll be creating these ecosystems, these mini versions of in truly, truly deep knowledge that will fuel us going forward. So that is what I wanted to share with you today, and I hope the call to action is very clear. It should be for science, it should be for governments, and maybe the most important thing to say in this room is industry can and must take a leading role here for ocean health and wealth. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Our third and last speaker before the panel, on which he will also take part, is Chief Scientist Jon Olav Tanda in Sintef Energi. John, you've been uh, working on offshore wind for more than 20 years. You were, in fact, part of developing the first floating wind turbine. You will talk about what will, will it take to get 30 gigawatts worth of intermittent offshore wind into the energy system in Norway and Europe, and what will it take for Norway to be an offshore wind champion? Wow, thank you. Not a small task for a Norwegian talking English with uh, maybe a slight uh, Danish accent. <laughs> you, you can try and listen, I've been told so, because I've been working seven years in Denmark at my early stage of career. Then I worked with land-based wind, and in 1997 I moved to Sintef, I continued working with wind, but soon realized that in Norway, land waste wind was a great opportunity to produce more energy, but it wouldn't really have an industrial impact. If you looked for industrial impact, we would need to go offshore because Norway has lots of offshore competence. So I started working with offshore wind quite early. I think uh, one of the first in Norway. And, uh, 
Now, eventually, this has become a big activity for Sintef. At Sintef, we are about 2,000 researchers, and a big part of these are now uh, working on offshore wind. And our flagship project on offshore wind is uh, North Wind. It's Norwegian Research Center of offshore wind. It's uh, what you could call a Norwegian Center of Excellence, where we work together uh, with other research partners, but also, more importantly, with 50 industry partners. And we do this to accelerate the development of offshore wind, to generate innovation, to reduce cost of energy, facilitate its sustainable development, create jobs, and grow exports. So trust us, we'll fix this. Huh? <laughs> okay. Um, it's a giga opportunity. Um, I think the previous speakers have been mentioning offshore wind. Our state minister mentioned, uh, not only just mentioned, he talked about offshore wind. Vester talked about offshore wind. Uh, politicians love to talk about offshore wind. And it is a giga opportunity. And I think it's great that we embrace this opportunity in Norway and in Europe. Um, in Norway, the ambition is to add 30 giga to offshore wind, some day by 2040, some day by 2050. My understanding is that the planning should be done by 2040, and then you should have built them by 2050. At least that's what's said in the Ost End Declaration between the nine countries that have agreed that they shall develop 300 gigawatts of offshore wind by, by 2050. So, uh, just let's do it. It's not a walk in the park. Um, one obvious thing is the access to expertise. We have over the years, in research collaboration with universities in Norway, developed something like 50 PhDs within offshore wind. Okay, in Norway we will invest a trillion Norwegian kroner to develop 30 gigawatt offshore wind. In Europe, they will invest about a trillion euros to develop 300 gigawatt offshore wind. It takes a bit more than 50 PhDs to do that. We need to scale up dramatically, not only on the PhD side, but also with technicians and, and everything. And these are huge investments. I think research is essential to lower the risk to understand what we are doing. Uh, uh, Tim talked about the race to the bottom, which is unhealthy, I think, uh, because we need to develop a sustainable industry which can make a profit. But he also mentioned that floating wind is a really new technology. Globally, about 60 gigawatt of offshore wind is installed. 0.2 gigawatt is, is floating, so this is new technology. But luckily, in Norway, we have been pioneering on this. We were the ones that installed, we, Equinor, installed the first floating wind turbine already in, in 2009. They did a test at Sintef in 2005. Uh, our CEO was there, actually, it's uh, quite uh, nice. Um, and we now just recently built the largest floating wind turbine wind farm in the world, Hyven Tampen, being, in put in being put in operation as we speak now. It's 88 megawatt, 0.1 gigawatt, more or less. But it's, we are moving there, things are happening, costs are still high, but it can be reduced. And my vision is that floating wind shall be cost competitive with bottom fixed. If we do the maths, just look at the material cost, installation cost. When the technology is matured, it can be competing head to head with bottom fixed, maybe even be cheaper. Market regulation and legal conditions, I think Tim address that, I will not talk more about that, uh, about data sharing. Kimberly made an excellent presentation highlighting the need for that. Uh, 
I would like to focus a bit on grid connection and power system operation. I think there was an earlier speaker that had highlighted that point also with, with stability, that inertia is declining with the more renewables you connect, the less inertia you get, you have an issue with stability. We'll fix that. It's a matter of control. But what we do need to do is to develop uh, the grid so that we can connect the 30 gigawatt of wind in time. And that is, of course, a very difficult task because there are lots of uncertainties, so we need to develop methods to, to do planning and good investments even in times of uncertainty. And then social acceptance and environmental impact to keep that on a minimum. Uh, again, previous speakers and debates have highlighted the expectations uh, aspects of this. This is, I would say, a license to operate. So, we have in Northwind some exciting developments, and these are just three examples I will just rush through as examples of, of results from research. One is on, on manufacturing. So this is about welding thick steel plates and doing that in a clever way with sort of a hybrid laser arc welding. And it can be nine times cheaper than the normal welding type. And doing this, of course, will reduce the cost of offshore wind because you use this thick steel place in the uh, floating construction place. This one is about developing technology to <coughs> connect floating wind turbines having a connection point at the seabed so you don't need to bring the cables first down and then up again to a transformer station, but you can have the, the transformer station at the seabed. That's quite interesting. And the third one is, is really funny. It's uh, using artificial intelligence, machine learning, to understand when a bird is approaching a wind turbine. And then you control the rotational speed of the turbine so if the, turbine, if the bird is about to hit the turbine, it will, it will uh, slightly adjust the speed of the turbine not to hit the bird. That's also a way to use machine learning. Okay, I see I run over time, so I will just mention these are important research activities. We should move from being a Norwegian center of excellence to a European center of excellence. That would be a good idea. Uh, and if Vestre is here, he asked for suggestions. That's my suggestion for you. Thank you. Johnny will stay on stage, um, and together with you, I will um, uh, invite up uh, uh, Richard Sanford. Richard, uh, head of Offshore Wind UK for BP. Uh, no coincidence that you are here, because you are a very valued partner to Statkraft at Sørli Norge 2. Um, you've been working with RWE and European level on the investment side, so a lot of insight from, uh, from you, Richard. And also uh, my colleague, uh, Giri Omot, who heads up uh, offshore wind for Statkraft in uh, the Nordic region. Uh, and we just uh, heard a lot of different perspectives, and uh, in this session it's also possible to use Slido. I'll get the questions up here and make sure the panel gets it. So let's uh, go straight to you, Richard. You heard your friend uh, Tim talk about <laughs> uh, learnings from, from the UK. Um, what are the success factors, uh, or as you put it in my conversation earlier, the key enablers and the key sort of barriers. So where do you see the, the, the offshore wind industry heading in, in Europe? Yeah, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to be with you today. It's a true honour. Um, I was here eight years ago um, with you celebrating Statcraft's 120th birthday. So great to be here eight years uh, on um, and talking about offshore wind. And actually, in those short eight years, offshore wind has moved dramatically. So the UK were doing their bit for offshore wind. We were developing projects, we were building projects. Um, and as Tim said, you know, became the, uh, the world leader in offshore wind. But here we are eight years on, the levelised cost of energy has massively reduced for offshore wind. We heard today how it's competitive with uh, other forms of uh, other technologies. And the whole world is now embracing offshore wind. So I can see offshore wind diversifying um, geographically. Um, 
Lots of countries in, uh, in Europe are embracing offshore wind, but we're seeing a lot of activity in North America um, and also in, uh, in Asia. So I've seen that um, diversification. There's also a shift in the players, the companies which are involved in offshore wind. Eight years ago, BP wouldn't be here um, investing in offshore wind. I've recently joined BP. They're leading. I'm really trying to make the energy transition happen, which is why I joined them. I want to be part of that exciting movement. So we're seeing different players in the market, and I think that's really helping enable offshore wind. But what we need in Europe, and I think what we particularly need in, uh, in Norway, is these ambitious targets. We've got ambitious targets. We need the right regulation in place. We therefore will need sustainable pricing, the right regulatory environment, so we can permit these projects, get them consented, um, and get them built. So I'll pause there. Great, thank you. Giri, you just heard John explaining sort of 300 gigawatt uh, ambitions in Europe, 30 gigawatt in, in Norway. First, have you reflect on what does it mean for the Northern European power system and the Nor Norway power system? And then I'll, I'll move on to your perspectives on sort of uh, Norway specific. Yes, no, that's a very good question. Um, and we also have this uh, excellent presentation from uh, Meredith and, and Torius also touching upon this. I think uh, we need to s uh, uh, understand that the way we are used to thinking about the European power system, that will change going forward. We're used to thinking about the European power prices as quite stable and quite high. Uh, and that will not be the case uh, going forward with an increasing amount of especially uh, wind and, and offshore wind uh, in the system. Um, that has implications. We will see uh, quite some uh, hours with very low power prices, uh, some with very high power prices, and, and there's a need to add flexibility to that system. And quite some people already have touched upon uh, one of the solutions to that uh, today. Hilda, for instance, on, on flexibility in the power grid. Uh, and, and also others have mentioned this uh, North Sea grid. So, uh, so we see that that will uh, develop in that direction, uh, where Norway will place itself in that discussion is, as we have understood uh, already today, uh, it's uncertain, there are intentions, uh, we'll see where we get that, but we see that our uh, North Sea neighbours, they are uh, talking a lot about this and they are also actually coming up with projects that links different European countries and offshore wind. Mm. In, in one. And talking about your Norway, talking about Europe, hybrids comes up. Uh, you heard Vesta said they will come. Uh, right now we need the power ourselves, but eventually they will come. What's Stockcraft's view on hybrids and, and also bottleneck incomes on, on hybrids? <laughs> and you need to explain to me and the audience okay, what bottlenecks okay, are. Okay. <laughs> yeah, where to start? I can start. First of all, hybrids in this context is uh, offshore wind farm and two cables. One to Norway and one to another country, just to have that clear. Um, we have uh, for a very long time said that we think hybrids m make more sense for Norwegian offshore wind. Uh, and the main reason for that is that the profitability of a hybrid is much higher than that of a radially connected uh, wind farm. Uh, I'm not saying that it, will comp that it won't need any subsidies at all. It's inc imp uh, impossible to say because the uncertainty is so high. Uh, but it's very certain that, that uh, the subsidies needed will be far less than uh, what they will be for a radially connected um, project. So that's why we're there. Uh, I also want to add that we have modeled hybrids in detail in Stadkraft, in lots of details, uh, and what we see is that uh, for all the relevant configurations, uh, we see a net inflow from the hybrid project to Norway. If we have a wind farm, we have a cable to Norway, we have a similar cable to the continent, then we actually see a lot of power flowing to Norway. We also see a lot of power flowing to the continent, but in general, uh, a net inflow to Norway over a period, for instance, a year, meaning lower prices, everything else equal. Just to be very clear on that. Good. Uh, we're starting to get some questions from the audience. Um, uh, I guess John, 
Does Norway have any chance of building a value chain in fixed bottom wind, or is floating wind the only real possibility at this point? Oh, Norway has a strong uh, value chain in bottom fixed already. Uh, for instance, with uh, cable manufacturing, with uh, substructures for um, for HVDC stations, uh, also for vessels for installation, for maintenance, for marine operations. So. Uh, Last year, no Norwegian industry made an export to the global market for offshore wind of something like 25 billion Norwegian kroner, and it was all related to bottom fixed. Mm. But of course, if we look further ahead, uh, the and we look at the global offshore wind potential, that can cover in total 18 times of the global electricity consumption. 80% of that is on deep waters where you require floating wind. And Norway is a pioneer in floating wind. We have, I would say, on top of what we have for bottom fixed, we have special competences on floating where we could take bigger market shares. And this new market is, is where we want to be. Any other reflections from what's been said from, from Richard and, um, and Guy? John, I want to... Um, no, I think it was quite clear what you said about the need for uh, an offshore grid. I think I share that uh, sort of uh, uh, wanting things to happen faster. Uh, we've been doing research on this for 20 years. And 20 years ago, we looked at the offshore grid and said, ah, oh, this is what we need to do because this is much better for system Europe than uh, single cables. And if you take the perspective of system Europe, it's quite obvious. Of course, if you take the perspective of a single country or a single operator, it becomes more, okay, what's, what's in it for me? Is that a good idea for me or not? But if you take sort of a more global perspective, and I think this is a big challenge. We need to solve the climate challenge. Offshore wind is part of that solution. It's not the only thing we need to do, but we need to do this, and we need to do it together in Europe. And our uh, heads of states just signed an agreement. We should do this. So I think there is a joint agreement. We should do it. But now they say, okay, we should do this by 2050. And I'm looking, well, where's the plans on how to do it? Because I don't see these plans yet, and I think we need to go ahead on that. Um, sustainability, we just heard uh, Kimberly share, and as a scientist, I guess, sort of uh, uh, collecting and sharing data is, uh, is a core business. <laughs> so, but how do you see that space evolving? And, and Richard and Guy, are we willing as BP and Statscraft to, to open up and, and start sharing that data? I certainly don't see why not. I thought it was a fantastic presentation, <laughs> Kimberly. Data is so important. Um, and already on um, BP's wind farms, we're out there, we're gathering data, we're measuring the sea, but we're trying to collect as much data as possible. And you're right, BP have been in the North Sea for well over 100 years. The data they must have is so valuable. We just need to find a way of pulling this data together, measuring where we are. And I know offshore wind developers work very hard to minimize their impact on the environment, do all we can to increase biodiversity, trying to do the right things, but without data, we can't prove it either way, so we're going to be having a conversation later. <laughs> I, I can just add that uh, it is, and it's all, all, already been said today, but it's an opportunity for Norway to set very high standards now. We are embarking on this now, uh, so we can establish processes that ensure sustainability, nature going forward. Some of the questions from the audience is quite technical. I was uh, in the toilet uh, in the break, and a very senior businessman came up to the first session, very, uh, very technical. So I will try to <laughs> try to <laughs> limit uh, some of it. But this one is, uh, is, uh, is another hybrid question, so Gri or whoever. Um, how would a cable, hybrid cable from Surly Nusha affect profitability for an offshore wind producer? Must not the offshore uh, wind turbines sit in the same bidding zone anyway? Yeah, and then we're touching upon regulations and what you call uh, uh, bottleneck income, so I can go there. Um, uh, this question of who gets uh, what part of the income, that's uh, being discussed, and that's 
easily, yet it's quite technical. So just to keep it high level, what we say in Statkraft is that there needs to be a fair distribution uh, between the owners of the wind farm and the grid infrastructure when it comes to income, uh, cost and risk. That's the easy answer to that. Very political uh, answer. <laughs> yes, but, it, but it's actually quite key, right? Because uh, <laughs> if, if, we, if the wind farm owner doesn't get the right incentives to invest, then we won't see an investment in the overall uh, asset, which we think makes sense. So what's a fair share? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll discuss that with Hilda afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> um, Richard, on the... Oh, you help. Welcome. Yeah, no, I agree. I, th I thought you asked what a fair share is, so um, <laughs> let's get to the next question. <laughs> uh, on the phone, you, you said there will be a certain amount of winners in the, this industry. So what characterizes a winner and uh, any chance of Norway becoming it? And I don't want the political uh, answer. <laughs> I think you're right, the companies and the countries that are, that are going to be winners, it's those, let's start with the countries. So we've heard innovation is really important. So countries that are willing to innovate, that are willing to create an industry which has the right level of, of innovation. Um, integration, I think, is really important. You know, these are green electrons, but we've, we've seen so many slides um, throughout today about how complicated the energy system is. So markets that, that can integrate this, uh, this green power, markets that can build a sustainable supply chain is really important. So not building everything in your country, but working out in each country, what are you really good at? Where is your competitive advantage? And then building it for your market and also exporting uh, globally. And building that skill base is going to be really, really important. Who are the winners going to be? I think the UK are already a leader. I think we're on a great journey. I think we're going to continue being up there. I think Norway stand a fantastic chance. And I think your heritage in oil and gas is going to be key to this, to be able to transfer the great learnings into offshore wind to really manage that energy transition. So I think um, I'm going to put the UK and Norway there. <laughs> <laughs> Very political. The only scientific uh, yeah. answer to this. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, in science, you know, we, we, science is always international. You don't have sort of uh, city uh, championships in science. It's, it's a global competition. But we also always collaborate internationally. So science, about, science is about sort of competition and collaboration. And I think a winning recipe for offshore win is also about competition and collaboration. On the European level, uh, mm -hmm. because we cannot do it on our own. Even UK can't do it on our own. Now we can't do it on our own. We need to collaborate to. But, but as Richard said, you really need to pick where you have a, a, yes. the edge. So, so where do we have the, the real competitive value? Because we, we, we approach this like and talk about it like it's yeah, the entire I, value yeah, chain. I would say uh, three topics: floating wind, grid integration, and sustainability. Okay. Last question to you. What can StatCup do to make sure that we are one of the winners? <laughs> we can have the best project together with our very capable partners. Uh, and I actually honestly think we have. I think we have uh, projects uh, where we capitalize on uh, the different owners in a very mm. good way. So okay. I'm, uh, I'm hoping that will take us uh, through. Thank you all three. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Jeg beklager, det ble ikke bare nasjonalistisk på slutten. Jeg ble litt sånn opphengt i det selskapet jeg gjorde for. Vi skal nå runde, og da gjør vi det på norsk. Og da vil jeg gjerne invitere opp styreleder Toril Widvei og konsernsjef Kristian Rynding Tønnesen på scenen. Vi har vært gjennom en lang dag, variert tema fra offshore wind til alle de andre temaene. Og det er jo ingen tvil om at både vi og Norge og Europa står overfor ganske store utfordringer, altså store muligheter. Så fra styrerommet, Toril, hva tenker du? Nei, det er ingen tvil om at i hvert fall hva vår visjon i Statkraft er mer aktuell enn noen gang. Vi ønsker jo å fornye verden med rene energi. Det har aldri vært så aktuelt som det vi opplever nå. Og det er også et faktum at energi har 
aldrig varit så omdiskuterat eller varit så centralt som det vi upplever nu. Vi står överför en enorm energiomställning. Vi har hört om i nära sagt hela eftermiddagen. Och vi har hört idag att det är många barriärer. Det är många viktiga hänsyn som måste tas. men det finns också fenomenala möjligheter för Europa, men inte minst också för Norge som förnybar nation. Och som Christian nämnde i sin inledning idag så vill Starkraft bygga ut mye förnybar energi både hemma men också ute i Europa och världen för övrigt. Och vi vill med andra ord gör vårt för att driva denna helt nödvändige utvecklingen och omställningen framöver. Christian, mm. vad är er det viktigaste du tar med dig från denna dagen? Jag syns vi har fått belyst en del av dilemmaerna. Jag tror alla som möter här har den inställningen att vi må ju visa handlekraft, men där er den ansvarigheten, vad är er det? Dilemmaerna, samarbete eh Fosen, Pilmaken, utbyggingen i Chile. Hur hur träffar vi de riktiga avvägningarna? Men jag har lyst til att avsluta med, med en optimism. Ehm alltså detta är er ju möjligt för världen och det är er möjligt för Norge. Så hvis vi den handlekraften, hvis vi bara brukar den förnuftigt så får vi ju detta till. det syns jag ska sitta igen. Och så står vi föran en uh, framtid hvor det er många osäkerheter. Professor Victor snackat om både risiko och osäkerhet uh, i i markedet, allt fra mänsklig adferd till teknologiosäkerhet och marknadsutsikt, geopolitisk osäkerhet. Men ska vi putt se in i kula då. Uh, Torin och Christian, vad hur ser det europeiska energisystemet ut om 50 år? Är er det är er det möjligt att se si något om det? Alltså energiomställningen i Europa den har ju absolut skutt fart som en reaktion och som ett resultat över krigen i Ukraina. Altså det är er behov för den omställningen jag har också hört idag raskare än det vi har sett för. Och samtidigt som har också hört att vägen mot dessa målen är er ju inte problemfri. Manglande nettillgång som Hilde har snackat om och arealkonflikter inte minst men också hänsynet till olika befolkningsgrupper, eh, kulturer och det är er minst det här med att få folk med oss att vi brukar mycket tid framöver för att få folk till att se nödvändigheten av, av denna energiomställningen som ska finnas till det. Får man till detta så är er jag virkelig troen på att Europa vill klara den omställningen och jag tror att Norge med den långvariga energierfarenheten som jag har så tror jag absolut att det är er behov för uh, vår kompetens och inte minst uh, vi är bygga Starkraft som Europas störste förnybarsällskap. Kristian, vad tänker du när vi står här i 2030? Eh, uh, hur ser marknaden och energisystemet i Europa ut? Det kommer att vara mycket mer uh, vindkraft speciellt i norr och mycket mer sol speciellt i söder och sol på väldigt många hustak också här i Norge. Vi kommer till att få stärkt vattenkraften vår och vi vill alla vara överraskade över vad vi har fått till. Så vi tror att i, I mitten av det århundre så vill cirka 90 % av all kraftproduktion i Europa vara förnybar och 80 % i världen. och så vill kraft utgöra cirka halvparten av all energi i världen. Så vill fortsatt vara en god del olja och gas igen, men väsentligt min nästan inte nog kul, cirka halvparten av den oljeförbruk vi har idag, men gassen vill vill fortsatt vara omtrent som idag. Så världen totalt sett vill vara dominerad av förnybar och en del gas. Och i Norge så står vi mitt upp i bägge delarna. Hörs väldigt bra ut. Tusen tack till de bägge. Då överlåter jag sist ord till dig, Torin. Tack ska du ha Klaus och då vill jag benytta möjligheten till att tacka er alla för att ni har tillbrakt denna eftermiddagen i samman med oss både ni som har varit deltagit digitalt men inte minst också ni som har varit till här i salen. Och så vill jag också få lov att tacka dagens moderatorer. Det är er Maruk Ali och Klaus Sundberg. Tusen tack till er. Jag syns ni ska ge dig en skiklig applåd för ni har lust att stå igen.